Good evening, everyone. As we are about to begin tonight's ceremony, I'd like to thank our Board of Education, seated up here in the front, for the faith and approval to make this a reality. Uh, we are almost 18 months away from when that was first approved, so thank you to the Board of Education. And I also want to thank the City of Collinsville for their continued partnership to make this possible. So please give them a round of applause. I'm Brad Skirdich, the Superintendent of Unit 10, and on behalf of the Board of Education and our entire district, thank you for attending tonight's ceremony. We are excited to welcome another outstanding group of alumni, community members, and former staff to the Collinsville Community Unit 10 Hall of Fame. Before we begin, I want to recognize Mark Alvers and Alex Conley for creating tonight's videos. Kim Collins for the time she put into each recipient's narrative. Jan Marie Harmon for the work she put into the beautiful program at your tables. And my boss, Susan Freckman, for the countless tasks that go into making tonight a reality. Thank you. Our district is fortunate to have unwavering support from our communities, businesses, and families. As a result, our students, past and present, flourish in the classroom and while participating in co-curricular activities, collectively preparing them for the challenges of adulthood, the importance of helping others, and paving the opportunity for success throughout their lives. Now, before we begin, please bow your heads in a moment of silence for the Hall of Fame members, inductees, family and friends that have passed or are unable to attend this evening. Thank you. Tonight, we welcome 12 individuals and two teams into the Hall of Fame, and we are proud to recognize this group of alumni, community members, and staff. Our purpose to share the rich history of our school district and allow our current students to witness the successes of prior generations that have walked in our hallways and have roots in our communities. Tonight, we celebrate our history and show our students what is possible now and in their future. Now, please join me in welcoming Clay Smith, our athletic director in CHS class of 1995 to the stage. Clay is one of the most passionate and dedicated educators in our district, and we are fortunate to thrive on his energy each and every day. His suit's pretty nice too, by the way. <laughs> he bleeds purple, and we appreciate all of his work to ma make tonight possible. Thank you, Dr. Skirdich. Thank you to our Board of Education. Thank you to our community. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight to support our Cahawk Hall of Fame. It's hard to believe that we are here already honoring our second class of the Cahawk Hall of Fame. I said this last year, but I would like to say it again. This night is truly a dream come true for me. When we begin having conversations to create the Cahawk Hall of Fame, it's amazing to think how fast it has all come together. While it has taken a lot of work for many, many people, being here in a room filled with purple with amazing people in attendance should bring a smile to everyone who loves Chaos Country. As you know and as you will continue to hear, our council community has fantastic stories to share. The pride, history, and tradition of Collinsville is like no other. Growing up in Collinsville and serving on our Hall of Fame committee, I'm amazed when we discuss nominations and the information we learn. There is always a conversation piece where someone in the room turns and says, really, I never knew that. I pride my work at CHS to continue our value traditions and teach our current students about who came before them and the accomplishments that they made. We have a room full of CHS students tonight that are either helping with the ceremony or are attending as guests. Our students in Collinsville Unit 10, grades K through 12, need to hear these great stories that we're going to tell tonight. 
so they can carry on these traditions and the Cahawk culture, both in the hallways of the schools that they attend and with their families. I want to congratulate all of our inductees and their families this evening. There are many people in this room that I grew up admiring, and they truly made an impact of where I am today. In closing, I want to share a quote from last year's induction ceremony by Chaos Hall of Famer Dr. Fred Riddle, who's in attendance this evening. He said, all around the nation, people know Collinsville is all about basketball. But I am more proud of the fact that I went to Collinsville High School and it made me what I am today. Have a great evening, wear your purple with pride, and go Cahawks. Thank you, Clay. Before we begin recognizing the class of 2024 Hall of Fame inductees, will the members of the class of 2023 Hall of Fame from last year, both teams and individuals in attendance, please stand. Thank you and congratulations and thank you for being here tonight. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Mark Shusky, Council High School Class of 1991. His knowledge, passion, and quick wit make him the perfect person to serve as our host for the evening. Mark is a wonderful father, educator, and community member, and he will be our Bob Hope for the next two and a half hours. <laughs> Bob Hope. Um, thanks, I don't think I can do that. I thought he was gonna call me Chris Rock and I was scared I'd get slapped uh, at some point, which of course might still happen. Um, anyway, um, I wanna thank again, both Clay and Dr. Skirdich uh, for their remarks and introduction. Their continued leadership of our Unit 10 schools, and in particular, their efforts organizing tonight's now annual event are deeply appreciated, and I think deserve both our gratitude and a round of applause for both Clay and Brad. Thank you so much. I personally am honored and frankly surprised uh, to have been asked to MC tonight's induction ceremonies again. Um, but I definitely appreciate it. Last year was truly a highlight for me. Uh, it is remarkable to see how the Cahawk Hall of Fame has already become an indelible institution in the fabric of our school district and our community. To be able to play a small part in this event is truly humbling given the luminaries who will be on this stage tonight and who are on this stage a, a year ago. And I certainly know that no one is here to hear me. So. Let's get the 2024 Hall of Fame induction ceremonies underway. We have an impressive group of current CHS students here tonight to help assist our inductees to the stage. Uh, and I would like to give our C Collinsville High School helpers uh, a round of applause as well. We couldn't do this without you, so thank you. <laughs> to our current students. And for each inductee, if you were not here last year, we have a video highlighting their accomplishments. And though he was mentioned already, I want to thank and credit Mr. Mark Alvers for his tireless and yet always cheerful work to produce these amazing videos. I've never worked with anyone, no offense to everyone else I've worked with in this room, uh, it is just always wonderful in, to work with, just pleasant and happy and, and an incredible uh, production that he always does, so thank you, Mark. Um, yes, absolutely. So after the video plays of our inductee, we will then ask the inductee to come up on stage to receive their award and to give their remarks. And then after their remarks, they will exit the opposite side of the stage for a photograph in most cases. Um, and we'll be doing the photographs out in the main hallway tonight. Um, and so with that, let's get started with our first inductee of the evening. It is an honor to introduce our first award recipient tonight, distinguished inductee, Mr. John Jack Renfro. John A. Jack Renfro 
1950 graduate of Collinsville Township High School and long-serving superintendent of Collinsville Community Unit School District Number 10, exemplified the phrase, once a Cahawk, always a Cahawk. At Collinsville Township High School, Renfro was a multi-sport Cahawk athlete, a four-year contributor in baseball, track, and basketball, including captain of the 1950 basketball team that took fourth in the state and the record holder of both 100 and 220 yard dash. He was a member of the Monogram Club and Student Council and Vice President of the Senior Class. Renfro attended Southern Illinois University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in education. He served in the U.S. Army in South Korea and played baseball on the USA Far East team. Jack began his career by teaching and coaching in several Illinois high schools. He completed a master's degree of education at University of Illinois and later received Illinois Administrative Certification. So early in his career, he was a teacher, but he was also a coach. And about that time, you know, I was, you know, five to 10 years old, oldest son, and I got to see my dad coach in some of these small high schools, every sport. I got to see my dad probably in his prime of motivating and driving, you know, toward excellence and accomplishment for the team, I think he took the spirit of being a great coach into his roles as a big principal of a large high school in Chicago and coming back to Collinsville and eventually being superintendent of schools for over 20 years. In 1970, Jack brought his wife Mary and four children back to his hometown, where he was an educator for five years before serving as superintendent for 22 years. Renfro enjoyed working in partnership with the school board members, staff, teachers, and community to support and strengthen educational opportunities for all students. And he had a skill that when he would talk to people, he would always give them dignity and respect so that they would feel that they had been heard and understood and appreciated. His ancestors were among the area's early pioneer settlers, having migrated here in 1810. Jack and Mary, with their four children, were the seventh generation of Renfro family to call Collinsville home. On stage, you know, dad gave me my diploma and then my sister Karen and my brother Bruce and my sister Jean, 10 years later. I mean, it was so important to him. It was like he was handing us into the next generation of our lives, really. That handshake and that embrace and getting the console diploma that meant so much to all of us. It was a unique moment and one that uh, we'll never forget. After a career of dedicated service, Jack Renfro retired in 1996. He had worked in public education in Illinois for over 40 years. Renfro died from heart surgery complications soon after his retirement. He is remembered as a loving and supportive father, grandfather, husband, and active community leader. His drive, energy, and hard work are still recognized today. Jack Renfro was awarded the Collinsville Spirit of Excellence Award in 1995 and Collinsville High School Alumni Achievement Award in 1998. The John A. Renfro Bright Future Scholarship is presented to a Collinsville High School graduate in his honor. The John A. Renfro Elementary School is named after him. Before he had to retire, the last big project that they had been working on was the enlarging and remodeling of Lincoln School. And after it was completed, we found out that it had been decided that it would be called the John Renfro School. That was a real time of acknowledgement for the efforts that he had made. It brought a great deal of joy to us. It is a beautiful school. We know that it would have made him so proud. 90% of all the schools in the state of Illinois never have an opportunity of doing what you're doing now. And that is welcoming a team back from the final four, and in this case, welcoming back some champions. They never get that chance. And because we're Cahawks, we seem to do it often. And that's a wonderful feeling. And go ahead and clap, you deserve it. And accepting on Mr. Renfro's behalf, his wife, Mary Renfro. Good evening. It is my honor to accept this year's Collinsville Cahawk Hall of Fame Award for my husband, Jack Renfro. Jack was the son of Dr. John Renfro. 
a Collinsville dentist, and Jane Renfro. Jack and his brother Dick attended Webster Grade School and Collinsville High School, where they excelled in numerous athletic teams. Later, Jack and I attended Southern Illinois University to prepare for teaching careers. During the next 15 years, he served in the Army in South Korea, was a teacher and coach, or an administrator in several Illinois high schools. At the University of Illinois, we both received Master of Education degrees, and then he continued his studies to earn the Advanced Administrative Certification. Jack was pleased to return to Collinsville in 1970 to help prepare for the opening of the new high school. His leadership continued as he became superintendent of schools in 1975 until he retired in 1996. This large school district had 10 elementary schools, North Junior High and Collinsville High School. He worked with the school board members as well as 20 administrators, 380 teachers, business staff, maintenance, transportation, food services, and the area vocational school. He wanted to develop a good working relationship within these areas and with parents and students. He tried to attend as many school activities, programs, and sporting events as possible, as well as community functions. When the planned enlargement of Lincoln School was completed, the name was changed in his honor to the John Renfro School. He was an analytical problem solver, determined, persistent, steady in a crisis. I know his character strengths of honesty, respect, and encouragement helped him in this work. And these strengths helped him within our family also. Even now, many years later, I can see many of these strengths in our four children. I remember how proud he was that he was able to give each of our children their high school diploma and to encourage them as they enter, entered colleges for various degrees. Jack and I were proud and grateful to have been a part of this supportive Collinsville community. Now I speak for the whole Renfro family to express our gratitude that Jack Renfro has been awarded membership in this distinguished group, the Collinsville Cahawk Hall of Fame. Thank you. So yes, thank you, Mary, for those remarks, and congratulations once again to Jack Renfro. Okay, our next inductee of the evening is an athletic inductee, Mr. Ken Oberkfell. Professional baseball player and manager Ken Oberkfell is a 1974 graduate of Collinsville High School. He played baseball for the Cayhawks and his senior year was the only unanimous selection on the All-Southwestern Conference team. He also was named to the Post-Dispatch All-Metro team. He was twice selected Collinsville's most valuable player, and the honor came as no surprise. His senior season, he led the team in runs batted in with 21 and a batting average of 444. His teammates will tell you, you could always tell when Ken was taking batting practice. The sound of the ball coming off his bat was different than the rest of ours. In a December 1973 interview, Cayhawk coach Terry Smith was asked about the upcoming season. He said, I have a senior shortstop you're going to hear about when the draft comes up next summer. Ken Oberkfell is a left-handed hitting shortstop who is a fine fielder, fast runner, and good hitter. I don't know if he'll be good enough to be a first round draft choice, but I do know a lot of pro scouts have been interested in him. I think he has a great potential to become a major leaguer. Oberkfell went on to play ball for Belleville Area College where he was named to the first team on the Junior College All-America baseball team. 
He was scouted by the St. Louis Cardinals and signed as a free agent on his birthday, May 4th in 1975. Continuing to produce big numbers, he played for farm teams in the Cardinals system, and then on August 22nd, 1977, at 21 years old, he broke into the big leagues as a second baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. He played for eight seasons in St. Louis. The highlight of his Major League Baseball career was being a member of the Cardinals' 1982 World Championship team as part of the best infield in baseball, alongside Tommy Herr, Keith Hernandez, and Ozzie Smith. In 1982, Obertfell, nicknamed Obi, added 289 with 55 runs scored and 34 runs batted in, en route to the National League East title. In Game 2 of the National League Championship Series against the Atlanta Braves, Obertfell made arguably the biggest play of his career hitting an RBI single in the bottom of the ninth to drive in the winning run, giving the Cardinals a 4-3 win. The right center field, Butler on the run, reaches up, can't make the catch. Green around third, comes in to score, and the Cardinals lead two games to nothing. And who can ever forget Ernie Hayes cranking out the Star Wars theme on the Bush Stadium organ every time Obi came to bat. Obergfell was traded to the Atlanta Braves in 1984 and went on to play for the Pittsburgh Pirates, San Francisco Giants, Houston Astros, and California Angels. Among his memories are playing for the Giants in the 1989 World Series during the historic game when an earthquake struck the Bay Area. He retired from playing in 1992. Obergfell transitioned to coaching and worked in the Philadelphia Phillies and New York Mets organizations. He was named Minor League Manager of the Year in 2005 and won Winter League and Caribbean Series championships managing in the Dominican Republic. He coached for several minor league teams and eventually retired to return to the Collinsville, Maryville area and coached for the Gateway Grizzlies. Today, he enjoys playing golf and mentoring young baseball players. He's also served as a color commentator for Cahawks Baseball on the Cahawks Sports Network. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is uh, quite, quite an honor from a little young kid who grew up in the little town of Maryville, Illinois, went to Collinsville High School. Uh, this is, listening to the speech before was a very good speech, and I was going to ask Mrs. Renfro if she'd like to be my agent the next time I, <laughs> the next time I walk, if she'd be my agent. We, we can go another five, ten years. I don't know if I can go ten years, but I'll try. Anyway, this is, uh, again, this, they were saying don't talk too long or don't talk too short. Well, hopefully I'm right in the middle. I mean, the Masters, you know, they had the gold jacket. No, they had the green jacket. And the one thing I the, the, the purple jacket. Chaos, purple jacket. <laughs> and it's nice to see my bodyguards are with me today. It's... It's important to me, <laughs> but in, in all of, in all basic fairness, is the everybody that gets these awards deserve every every last one of them, and uh, I'm just very thankful to be part of it. And uh, one of the last things I always say now when I give speeches, I always sit up there at the end and I say, "Once a Cayhawk, always a Cayhawk." Thank you, Mr. Obergfell. Congratulations. We have your award as well. So, Ken, this is from two of your former teammates. This is Rick Horton, and I am uh, really honored to be able to send this video in uh, congratulations of my friend Ken Obergfell uh, for be his induction into the uh, Hall of Fame. And aside from uh, the uh, great player that you were and, of course, uh, part of the uh, great defensive infield, probably the best defensive infield in uh, maybe history, certainly Cardinal history, but uh, uh, you guys were uh, phenomenal and, uh, and and not only that, a, a great clutch hitter and a smart player too. And I also had the great memory, Obi, of you and I coaching a fantasy camp a team together. I'm sure you remember that. I mean, we I don't think we won a game uh, with, the, with the players that we had and we had no chance to do that, but you and I had a blast together. We had fun with them. We had fun with each other. So uh, just again, uh, congratulations on your honor. Uh, I appreciate your friendship, uh, OB, and look forward to seeing you down the road. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Ozzie Smith. I'd like to take a second to congratulate my teammate, 
Ken Obergfell on being elected to the Collinsville Sports Hall of Fame, a very deserving honor to a person who has long been one of the most underrated third basemen to play the game. I'm very honored and very happy to have had the opportunity to play with not only a great player, but a great human being. Congratulations, Ken. Pretty impressive, Mr. Obergfell. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your remarks. Now, our next inductee of the evening, an athletic inductee, Francesca Caliso. Years before 2010, Collinsville High School graduate Francesca Franny Steiner Colisa was a girls bowling state champion. She was a five-year-old participating in the Bumper Bowling League at Camelot Bowl in Collinsville on Saturday mornings. She enjoyed the activity, but never dared to dream of being Illinois' top girls bowler one day. When she entered CHS, Colisa was a strong competitor, but didn't win tournaments or demonstrate the top level abilities that are often associated with champions. It was late in her high school career under head coach Sean Hay that the stars aligned for Colisa to lead the Lady Cahawk Bowlers to a phenomenal 2009-2010 season that included Southwestern Conference title, Cahawk Team Challenge champions, Abe Lincoln Invitational champions, Elite Six Invitational Champions, Panther Team Challenge Champions, Sectional Champions, and IHSA State Champions. Kalisa's calm and cool demeanor was a contributing factor in the Cahawk Girls Bowling State Championship in 2010. The pressure was overwhelming, honestly, because she knew she was bowling well, so she knew she was up in the medal contention, but she also knew that the team was there too. So we were in a situation where we just bowled our worst game of the, of the tournament, the 11th game. So she was so focused on the team, she wasn't worried about herself. She just wanted to get the ball in the pocket and pick the spare. At the state tournament, bowling a 229 average for 2,756 pins, including three consecutive strikes in her final frames, helped the Lady Cahawks clinch the team championship and earned her the individual state title. She was named 2009-2010 SIHSBC Player of the Year and St. Louis Post-Dispatch Female Athlete of the Year. That whole team had, had, had known that they had all put in the time. They had all been there. It took all of them to do it. Franny obviously led the way. Obviously winning first as an individual, that was amazing. We've had two girls throw 300s, um, so Franny was the first to do it, and she did it at a Springfield tournament. Today, Kalisa is shaping the next generation of high school bowlers. She has been the girls' head bowling coach for Triad High School since 2015. She is grateful for the opportunity to coach young women at an influential time in their lives and share her experience with them. And, ex and accepting on behalf of Franny is her husband, David, because, of course, Franny is coaching at the Bowling State Tournament this weekend. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, she uh, sent me her speech, and I hope I don't mess it up too bad, because I will never hear the end of it, because she is her mother's daughter. <laughs> good evening, everyone. I want to take a moment to thank the Hall of Fame Selection Committee for selecting me as one of the inductees being honored here tonight. Being honored for our team accomplishments last year was already such an amazing experience that I can't even begin to express my gratitude for being here two years in a row. I know it's also important to acknowledge the multiple people who helped mold me into the successful, successful person that I am today. To my parents, Steve and Josie, my sister Marissa, the Hartmans, owners of Camelot Bowl, Nancy Overby, Joe Lejeune, Sean Hay, Gary White, and past teammates, thank you. Each of these people in many different ways made me the person and bowler who was able to accomplish what most people can only dream about in their lives. It all started with a little girl whose parents signed her for, up for a Saturday morning bumper league where she would be a part of her first bowling team, the Little Mermaids. This would be the beginning of a career that would end up making school history. Many of you don't know this, but the start of my time as a Cahawk bowler wasn't exactly Hall of Fame material. It was filled with many hardships, major life lessons, and hurdles that seemed impossible to overcome. All of those themes helped drive me to become a state champion. 
While there seemed to be many obstacles standing in my teammates and I's way, we were able to break many records, win many tournaments, and come out on top in the end. As an individual, I was able to bring home multiple tournament awards, which included a 300 game my senior year, none, uh, and uh, none of my family was able to see that because they missed it. <laughs> it is what it is. I was named the 2009-2010 Southern Illinois High School Bowling Conference Player of the Year and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch Post Female Athlete of the Year. My four years as a Cahawk at CHS went by faster than I could have imagined. The memories and accomplishments will stay with me for many years to come, and I hope that these accomplishments inspire future Cahawks along the way. I can say without a doubt, that I'm proud to be a K-Hawk. Now, um, as you can tell, she is extremely well-spoken and very humble. She did give me permission to insert myself somewhere in her speech because she wasn't sure how to do it since she wouldn't be here to give it. So I have chosen to take just a few moments and give my examples for what makes her a second time Hall of Fame recipient. We have been together 15 years this coming May Growing up with her and watching her become such an empowered woman and inspiration to female athletes in this area is nothing short of an honor. As stated, she's been coaching the girls team at Triad High School. She's the coach that you hope your kids will get. She's always there for them on and off the lanes, makes them feel safe while on her team and in that time has helped some of her girls get bowling scholarships for their college careers. She makes me proud every day that she still continues following her passion for bowling and countless contributions to both her team and this school district. She's accomplished so much in such a short period of her life, so I can say without a doubt that I am thoroughly excited to see what else she's going to achieve in the next 15, 20, and 30 years. Thank you all for your time here tonight, and more importantly, for honoring her. Thank you, David. Congratulations to Franny. Please tell her. Thanks for her remarks and congratulations. David, have you ever beaten her? Have you ever beaten her in bowling? Once. Congrats. Congratulations. All right, so hopefully we've all finished up dinner. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the evening tonight. So our sponsors include Redmond Insurance Agency, Collinsville, Maryville, Caseyville Rotary, Holland Construction, the Collinsville Chamber of Commerce, and Jim Deck, Goosehead Insurance, and other sponsors who wish to remain anonymous. So thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you tonight. And speaking of financial sponsorship, at everyone's table tonight, you will find a program for the evening, which celebrates each inductee, and each table also contains a self-addressed envelope with information regarding the Collinsville Area Community Foundation, or the CACF, and their current initiatives benefiting students, facilities, and all of our communities. Please review, and we encourage everyone in attendance tonight, and everyone not in attendance tonight, to make a contribution which can be dropped off at the table in the back on your way out with our student volunteers or placed in the mail. Your generosity helps students and will better our communities. Now, our next inductee of the evening is a distinguished inductee, Mr. Everett William Singleton. Everett Singleton was born in 1914 to Leroy and Maud Singleton. He grew up at 416 North Summit Avenue in the heart of Collinsville's traditional black neighborhood during segregation. Young Everett attended Lincoln School for Blacks on Gothi Avenue, but graduated from high school elsewhere because Collinsville Township High School did not admit black students until 1940. He earned a teaching degree from Illinois State Normal University. ISNU, today known as Illinois State University, had been admitting black students since 1899. He was probably 18 years old and the first time he ever stepped into a classroom with a white student. So that must have been so eye-opening to him. 
And if you look at some of the things about his time at Illinois State, you could tell he was very active, he was involved. His college years started his lifelong journey of breaking down the color barrier. Despite the roadblocks he faced, Everett appeared to have been an active and popular student at ISNU. A gifted musician like his father, Everett sang first tenor in the University Glee Club and was part of their traveling group. To this day, I could still hear his voice in my head. Um, he did have a powerful voice. He was a great orator. He was a, a great musician and a great singer. The 1934 Index Yearbook has many listings for him, including the Men's Glee Club. After college, Singleton returned to his roots in Collinsville. He became a teacher and eventually the principal of Lincoln School for Blacks. He married Lily V. Barker, who had graduated from Collinsville Township High School in 1940 with the first class that accepted black students. Mrs. Singleton became an elementary school teacher in Collinsville. He was involved with the Collinsville United Fund, Collinsville Teachers Education Association, Boy Scouts of America, and the Collinsville Chorus. Local Collinsville historians believe Mr. Singleton's leadership and character were among the factors that convinced the Board of Education to close the school and integrate its students and staff into other schools in the 1950s. Following the integration of schools in Collinsville, Singleton served as a sixth grade teacher at Summit Elementary and later Webster Elementary. Family friend and former student Richard Mark remembers Mr. Singleton. My dad went to school with Mr. Singleton. And if you look at that picture, the class picture from the old Lincoln School, my dad's right standing right behind him. So I was excited to go into his class, and unfortunately, I got they split the classes in two, and I went to the other class. You know, you'd be out in the hall, and maybe you'd be talking a little loud, or kids would be running, and he didn't have to say anything. He'd just walk out in the hall and give you that look, you know, and you knew it was time to behave and go the other head and straighten up. When you saw him, he had such a presence, he demanded respect. You know, and he was always impeccably dressed, but um, he was just a person that was known throughout the community as being a leader, uh, being a role model, being someone who was concerned about uh, young African American kids getting an education. It gave me that glimpse into what being a professional would be like, you know, what they look like, their actions. He was a role model. Everett Singleton died of a sudden heart attack in 1970 when singing for a Christmas meeting of the Webster Elementary Parent Teacher Association. He basically laid the foundation for my generation and others to really know that if you work hard, you get a good education and persevere, that you can be anything that you want to be. And accepting on Mr. Singleton's behalf tonight is Robbie Barker. very much. <clears throat> I don't have a prepared speech or anything, but it's, it's an honor to accept this award for uh, my uncle, Uncle Everett. And uh, if he were here, I'm sure he'd, uh, uh, he'd love this award. Thank you. And congratulations to all the inductees uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Barker. Okay. Next up, we have inductees from athletic inductees for the 1986 boys soccer team, coached by Jim Strands, Charlie Suarez, and Andy Cosberg, along with team members Mark Alvers, Jason Ostrowskis, Keith Brook, Brett Cassidy, Jeff Deutsch, Jason Doctor, Matt Doctor, Rob Hartman, Grant Highlander, Brian Hunt, Tim Johnson, Matt Keller, Mark Kraus, Brian Crum, Eric Massa, Christian Motor, Dave Mueller, Jason Mueller, Brad Patton, Joe Reiniger, Joe Schallert, Scott Siegel, Paul Smith, Clint Tucker, David Winson, and managers Chris Rosencrantz and Pam Moon Goodridge. The 1986 Collinsville Cahawk boys soccer team was the second Cahawk soccer team to win the state championship only five years after the 1981 team won. 1986 was the second consecutive state tournament appearance by the Cahawks. They posted a second place finish in 1985, losing in the final two minutes of a Mud Bowl championship game. So the 1986 team started the year hungry for the championship. Nine returning starters were seniors who had a score to settle in Chicago. A big key part was, I think the team was more relaxed, more 
more confident, especially having gone the year before. They played together since kids. The advantage that we always had is our kids had been playing together for 10 years or more. I mean, you know, they knew each other. They just instinctively worked together. The 1986 Cahawks finished the season with a 19-4 and two record. Defense was their strength. 17 of their 25 games were one goal games. This team had skilled players, great players in each area of the play. From the backside with Mark Alvers is Mark is the, is the keeper. He's repeating all state, all tournament team from the year before. We had Keith Brook, probably the premier sweeper in the area at that time. I thought he was a premier sweeper, but Keith Brooks was, was the reason that uh, our defense was so solid. And especially toughness with Rhett Cassidy. He, he was the destroyer. You know, like a middle linebacker, anything that happened in the center, there he was. Brett was a key player, maybe not the most skillful player, but definitely the toughest kid. And then on the wings, we had Brad Pat was just a gazelle. Uh, David Mueller, uh, those two were solid. There was no other team that we played that was as skillful or had as skillful wingers like Robbie Hartman and, and Jeff Deutsch. Then you had the great play, Joey Schaller. Then again, you had the toughness of Clint Tucker, tough as nails Clint. And then you had the two scorers, Joey Reinecker, what, what he was and what he was going to be. But then you look at Timmy Johnson, you look at Timmy Johnson, you think, well, this guy, who's, who's this guy? All he did was score. Uh, but we, we had a solid team, but that's why you win, because you, you don't just have 11 top players. You've got a solid backup, and we had a lot of great backups. Eric Massa, Jason Mueller, Jason Ostrowskis, Paulie Smith, Mark Krause, we had a solid group of juniors that year. At the state tournament, the Cahawks won the first game 1-0 on Friday night against St. Charles. Clint Tucker scored on an assist from Jeff Deutsch only nine minutes into the first quarter as the Cahawks defense recorded the shutdown. Keith Brooks saved on off the line. Mark Alvers kept saving him. But Keith Brook, I think, single-handedly kept two or three balls out of the goal, and it was 1-0. Uh, Next, on Saturday morning, the Cahawks played Winnetka Nutrier. The game remained scoreless after four quarters and four overtime sessions. Two rounds of penalty kicks decided the game. Senior goalkeeper Mark Alvers stopped two penalty shots, leaving freshman Scott Siegel to deliver the clincher. The game lasted nearly three and a half hours. Later that night, in the championship game against Libertyville, the Cahawks were down 1-0 when sophomore Joe Reiniger tied the game, scoring off a free kick in the third quarter. And the free kick, Joey Schallert and, and uh, Joey Reiniger have been practicing for a long time. And Joey Reiniger hit it with his left as Joey Schallert swung with his right. I remember the goalkeeper moving one way and the ball didn't just barely miss him because he didn't know which foot the ball was coming off of. As the match was in the fourth overtime, Joe Reiniger passed the ball to Tim Johnson, who put away the game-winning goal. It took a wild quarterfinal fourth quarter, double overtime penalty kicks, and six sudden death sessions before the emotionally drained Cahawks were crowned state champions for 1986. Midfielder Jeff Deutsch and goalkeeper Mark Alvers were named to the All-State team that year, marking the first time two Cahawks had been named to the squad in one season. The pair were also named to the All-Tournament team for the second year in a row. Many of the 1986-87 seniors from the state championship team went on to play college soccer at the Division I level. This was by far the most skillful team. That 86 team was, a, was the, by far, by far the most skillful. Uh, so the 81 team, like I said, broke the glass ceiling. The 86 team really solidified our power in Southern Illinois. Please welcome to the stage the 1986 soccer team. Wow, that was a lot made it. That's impressive. Thank you, 86 team. Speaking on behalf of the team tonight will be team captains Tim Johnson and Mark Alvers. And we have trophies for every one of you. Good evening, my name's Tim Johnson and uh, on behalf of Mark and I and the team, we would like to give a special welcome and recognition to the families of our highly loved and missed teammates, Jeff Deutsch, Joe Schallert, Brett Cassidy, and Mark Krause. Let's hear it from them, guys. <laughs> Accepting tonight's award on behalf of Jeff Deutsch is his mother, Sharon. Accepting on behalf of Joe Schallert are his two sons, Alex and Robbie. Thank you. 
and accepting on behalf of Brett Cassidy is his wife, Jennifer. <clears throat> um, as a team, we would also like to, to thank our families um, for all the hard work and support over the years. Uh, a lot of running to practices, games, car washes, bake sales, uh, costly but fun road trips. Um, special mention to my father, Gene Johnson, who coached many of us up here for uh, probably 10 years or plus. Um, he was a pillar in the early days of Collinsville soccer. I'd like to thank Andy Cosberg, Charlie Suarez, and Coach Strands. Uh, they always kept us, kept us in shape, focused for the games. Um, Jim know, knew how to keep it light um, when it got a little tense. Uh, Susie's got that feeling, boys. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Yeah. So this was actually one of my favorite videos to do this year, so I know you know why. Um, Originally, Coach Strands was supposed to be here uh, and speak on our behalf tonight, but he had a cruise that he purchased back during COVID and had to use it or he was going to lose it. So um, <laughs> we can all give him a hard time later on. But if any of you know Jim Strands, uh, he probably did us a favor because he saved us about a 25-minute speech because uh, he likes to talk soccer quite a bit. So I remember the very first day of practice in 1986. Uh, we all came back from 85 uh, feeling accomplished and that we had really done something. Um, and we, we were a little cocky that year, but Coach Strands, the very first thing he said to us, he said, boys, he said, you're only as good as your last game, and the last game you lost. So we have some work to do. So that really set the tone for us in the 86th season, and at the end, Strands was right. We were only as good as our last game. We were state champions. Yeah. I, I think Mr. Cosberg has a little video clip that he's going to kind of show us and walk us through. Uh, Want to go ahead? Well, a little, something a little bit on the lighter side. Why don't we just go ahead and uh, show this video. A lot of the team probably never saw this. Uh, Collinsville basketball fans probably saw this, but you didn't believe it when it happened. Uh, go ahead and roll that video, if you would, about the... Uh, we made a challenge... Coach Strands, Suarez, and I made a challenge. <laughs> At least one of us was sober that night. And we made a challenge that if the boys went and won state, we would do the dance at the first home basketball game of the year. So for those of you on the team that never saw this, I could do that still, but I wouldn't be able to get up. Uh, turns out my neighbors um, were the K-Hawk dancers, so they, they taught me how to make a crazy uh, six-foot fire hoop to, to, do, uh, to do that. And Coach Strands and I went out there and did that. First uh, home basketball game of the year in 86. Thank you, Kaz. Uh, in closing, guys, uh, it was an honor for us as a team uh, to put the purple on and, and play, uh, sometimes literally fight for each other. We all remember the brawl at the bowl against Belleville East. Um, and if you've never seen that video, Mark will be showing it at Hurricanes tomorrow evening. <laughs> uh, it was an honor to play for this community and the guys who played before us. And it's an honor to be part of this room of outstanding individuals and this accomplished Hall of Fame induction class. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1986 Hall of Fame State Championship Soccer Team. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, Kosberg, I feel like I have to know which one of you was sober. Also, I would really love to know Coach Bone's feelings looking at that flame on his basketball court. He'll have a chance to tell us if you'd like. All right, congratulations again to the 1986 soccer team. An incredibly impressive achievement. Thank you for your remarks. Well, speaking of, our next inductee of the evening 
is an athletic inductee, Mr. Bob Bone. Bob Bone, a 1973 graduate of Collinsville High School, had a full circle Cahawk career. After being an all-state basketball player for the Cahawks, he later returned to CHS, where he served 21 years as a physical education teacher, basketball coach, athletic director, and assistant principal. Bone was a 5'11", three-year starting guard for Cahawk basketball. Although remembered for his high school basketball prowess, Bone was also a standout baseball player. Playing second base for the Cahawk baseball team, he earned a spot on the 1973 Metro East Prep All-Star team. Bone and shortstop Ken Oberfeld gave the Cahawks the defense up the middle needed to post the school's first 20 victory season. During his high school basketball career under legendary coach Virgil Fletcher, Bobby Bone was a member of two IHSA regional and sectional championship teams and two elite eight teams. Bone scored 954 career points and averaged 17 points per game his senior year. As a senior, he was named All-Conference, All-State, All-State Tournament, and MVP of the Carbondale Holiday Tournament. Bone was chosen by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch for the 1973 East All-District Team. Coach Fletcher remarked to the press that Bob was the finest fourth quarter clutch player in the history of Collinsville basketball. He's probably one of the most competitive players we've ever had. was recruited by numerous colleges following his high school career. He finally settled on the University of Missouri-St. Louis, where he again was a two-sport standout in baseball and basketball. As a second baseman for the Rivermen, he earned All-American honors. As a guard for basketball coach Chuck Smith, he became the most prolific scorer in St. Louis collegiate history. During his collegiate career, he scored 2,678 points and had 446 assists. He set 19 individual records during his career. He averaged 31 points a game his senior year and is still the all-time leading scorer in UMSL history. He was a three-time NCAA Division II All-American. He was also named Academic All-American and received an NCAA postgraduate scholarship based on his athletic and academic accomplishments. He was named to the UMSA Hall of Fame in 2001. After finishing his playing career, he entered the coaching ranks. He spent four successful seasons at East Central Junior College before returning to Collinsville to restore the proud tradition of Collinsville basketball. He would also later become the athletic director at CHS. During his 20 years at Collinsville, his teams won 10 conference championships, including a streak of nine out of 10 championships from 1987 to 1996. His teams also won 13 regional titles, three sectional titles, and made three state tournament appearances. Bob eventually left coaching to become an assistant principal at CHS and finished his career as the athletic director at Clayton High School in Missouri. Bone was inducted into the Illinois Basketball Hall of Fame as a player in 1989 and as a coach in 2006. In April 2020, KSDK Sports ranked Bob among the 15 best St. Louis basketball players of all time. Hi, this is Frank Cusimano, and I want to congratulate Bobby Bone on making it to the Collinsville Hall of Fame. You know, I've covered a lot of basketball over the years. I think Bobby Bone is the greatest scorer in the history of our state. I mean, who averages 30 points a game? Who scores 2,600 in their career? Who scores 46 in a single game? He was instant offense and an unbelievable athlete and a great coach and a good man. Congratulations, Bobby Bow. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Bob Bone. Thank you. Wonderful evening, and uh, my first game coaching at Collinsville was the night of Cosberg and Strands <laughs> and Suarez dancing around. They needed a fire hoop about the size of a fire truck <laughs> to get Cosberg through one of those, but I think they did that. So it was a great event. It was uh, 
something that uh, we tolerated because, like I said, that was my first experience of coaching at Collinsville, and I said, boy, this has changed. This used to be a basketball school. <laughs> it's a great honor for me to be here tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my family for being here, my wife Kathy and our children, Jack, Leslie, Darren, Chris, BJ, Matt, Matt, Nathan, and Leah. And then my sister Sandy and her husband John, my brother Jim, his wife Tama, and my brother really helped make me a better player when I was young. He's five years older than I is, so every time we would play, he just beat the snot out of me. <laughs> it made me tougher. He did, his skills weren't very good, but like I said, he, he knew how to uh, get through and get some stuff done. An honor for me to be going in with Kenny Overfeld. We played together at, uh, at Collinsville on Legion teams. And, and when Kenny hit the ball, it was just different. I mean, I'd hit the ball and it'd sound poof. And he'd hit it and it'd be crack. And the ball'd just be a line drive somewhere. What a great player. Kenny, it was really an honor to, to play with you those years. And we had a great time, so, so thank you. But Mr. Renfro, the superintendent, former coach, uh, was a mentor. Denny Pace and I worked together. Kevin Stallings and I are, are used to be friends, but <laughs> he didn't show up tonight. <laughs> but for me, growing up in Collinsville in the 60s and 70s was perfect. I wanted to play basketball and I wanted to be a Cayhawk. I was fortunate to play the last game in the old gym and I played the first game in, in the new gym and, and playing for for Virgil Fletcher was, was a great honor, but coach was tough. I mean, coach uh, was hard to play for. First game my senior year, we're playing at home and, and I made my first nine shots. So I'm nine for nine, got 18 points. There's no three point line at that time. And I came down because, came out down on a fast break, two on one fast break with Mark Fletcher. On the side, me on the other side, I fake it to Mark. I shoot, I miss, so I'm nine out of 10. Ball goes out of bounds, the horn blows. Guy comes in for me, I walk over to the bench and Coach Fletcher's sitting there and he's looking down at the floor. I can see him today like he's sitting in the first row. And he doesn't even look, lift his head up to look at me. He just says, you'll pass it next time. <laughs> and that was it, I didn't play again the rest of the evening. So, <laughs> and I did, next time my mark was open, I got him the ball. The uh, being successful in Collinsville was never uh, success in a vacuum. It was always the people around you made you successful. When I was a sophomore and playing on the sophomore team before coach decided to kick everybody off the varsity team and bring us up, I thought I was a point guard. So we'd go to practice and Terry Smith was a sophomore coach and he would put me at off guard. And I'd tell him I'm a point guard coach he said, you need to play off guard. And so this went on for a few days and I was pouting, being like a 14, 15 year old kid and mad and angry and not playing hard. And finally he calls me to the side and he said, I'm gonna tell you something. He says, you really need to learn how to play this position. And I said, I'm a point guard. He said, no, you're not. He said, you're an off guard. And I said, why? He said, because there's a freshman kid in Collinsville that's going to be the point guard next year. And so you can either play behind him and sit next to me on the bench, or you can learn to play a different position. And that point guard was Mark Fletcher, and he was going to play, so I either had to learn a new position or sit over by with, with Coach Smith. So Coach Smith, that was great advice to, to tell me that. As I said, Coach Fletcher was uh, really influential in my, my life and my career. And when I was coaching at Collinsville, he would come down to practice frequently and, and he'd walk in and he'd kind of look around and, and watch us play for a while and I'd normally meander over to coach and I'd always say, coach, what do you think? And he'd look at me, just shake my, his head and he said, man, he said, if I'd have had players like this, he said, I'd never lost a game. <laughs> I said, coach, you had Denny Pace and you had Terry Bethel and you had Bogey Redmond and Fred Riddle. He said, yeah, these little guys were all right, but he said, nothing like the guys you got. He said. <laughs> Kevin uh, could not be here tonight, but he's always been, him and I have been close to the last, for a long time. And he would always introduce me 
when we would go somewhere and meet some of his friends as Bob Bone, he's coached at Collinsville, he says, but he played on Virgil Fletcher's worst team. <laughs> and and I finally got to the point, I said, that's right. We were three and 19 when I was a sophomore. I said, but the next two years we went to the state tournament. And I said, the key is, Kevin, is after he coached us when I was a sophomore, we went three and 19. Coach came back for another year. I said, he coached your slow rear end and called it a career. <laughs> As I said, I coached for 20 years. We won a lot of games, but it was never solely about the winning the games. I mean, it was always important, but the things that, that our program stood for and the things we were able to do with the, the people that, that put up with me for, for those 20 years, and a lot of them are here tonight, and I would love to be able to just thank each one of them individually, but I can't do that. Obviously, time, Clay's already looking at me like, you gotta go. I know you should have played more, Clay. I, I missed it. <laughs> but in those 20 years, we won 10 conference championships, 13 regionals, three sectionals, and a bunch of games. But it was the the pride that, that our players had in the program that was restored to, was like when I was playing and the, uh, the cohesiveness and brotherhood that's formed by those players even today. And I see them and, and it's uh, really rewarding for me to see them now rather than when I was trying to coach them because when I was trying to coach them, they didn't listen very well. When I was, <laughs> now when I talk to them, they all say, yeah, we should have listened better. One of the keys to my success was my assistant coaches, uh, and I only had 11 of them in 20 years, and stability in the program was one of the things that made us great. But Tim McChristian, Jim Sika, Dennis Pace, Joe Muniz, Steve Rustio, Tony Edgar, Russ Keene, Jim Bone, Dan Darlington, Mark Parker, and Brian Young. And I want to just give them a, an applause because they deserve it. Thank you so much. A special guy to me that really helped me through some difficult times when we weren't playing well and things weren't going well was Jerry McChristian. I know Jerry's here tonight, and I wanted to say thank you. Uh, you walked me off the ledge a few times, so I appreciate that. My college career was uh, great. I got to play both sports and got to shoot a lot. I shot all the time, in fact, but it was, it was great. And, and everybody asked me, who's the best player you ever played against? And it was, it was Larry Bird. And we went over to Indiana State to play them. And Bird was, I don't know, his junior or whatever. And, and we're looking at him. And I'm kind of standing there with my college roommate that was going to be guarding him. And I'm saying, you know, he's, he's slow. He can't jump. He's got on a pair of canvas Converse. You know, his hair is kind of like a blonde mullet. I said, you can guard this guy. Well, we go out, and uh, Bird has 47, I think. If... <laughs> and I say to my roommate, I said, Jimmy, I said, what, what happened? He said, he said, oh, he said, I guarded the heck out of him. He said, against anybody else, he'd have had 50. <laughs> As I said, this has been a great honor for me. It was a... Uh, Really a great honor to play at Collinsville. There's no better place to play high school basketball than Virgil Fletcher Gymnasium. I, I've been everywhere. I've been to Quincy and been to, you know, where, Centralia and, and all these places. And Collinsville is the best. And the thing that made us the best is our fans and the passion that they have for the, for the purple and white. And the idea that the referees never get a call right has always sat real well with me too. It's, it's <laughs> tremendous. Um, so it, it's been an honor and for all these years, just thank you. That's it. I will say this, this is my grandson, Dane, played soccer for Collinsville the last four years, a four-time four all-conference player, four 
Southwestern Conference Championships. So it is a soccer school, I guess. We didn't. Thank you, Mr. Bob Bone. That was incredible. Okay, that takes us to our next inductee of the evening. This is a distinguished inductee, Admiral Bill Baumgartner. Retired U.S. Coast Guard Rear Admiral William Bill Baumgartner is a 1976 graduate of Collinsville High School. While at CHS, Baumgartner excelled in music, science, math, and Latin. He was class salutatorian, president of the CHS band, team captain of Scholar Quiz, and a member of the All-State Repertory Band. He competed in math and science competitions throughout his high school career and won the state Latin title three consecutive years. Preparing for his future, Baumgartner shares how the Coast Guard became a reality. My path from Collinsville really started, I think, in the se my senior year in high school. I didn't even know we had a Coast Guard. And in the fall of that year, John Chimkus, classmate of mine, who was interested in going to West Point, came to me and said, hey, there's this cadet from the Coast Guard Academy. He's gonna be at our high school the day before Thanksgiving. Will you come with me and we'll talk to him? And John, myself, and Jeff Lunar, another classmate, we all went to go talk to this cadet just to see what the Coast Guard Academy was, or in my case, what the Coast Guard was. After that, I kind of liked the idea of the Coast Guard, and I decided to apply. In June 1976, he entered the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, where he graduated first in his class, earning Bachelor of Science degrees in marine engineering and electrical engineering. Upon graduation from the academy, he had multiple assignments as an officer in the Coast Guard. While serving, he went back to night school and earned an MBA from the University of New Orleans and then a Juris Doctor, magna cum laude, from Harvard Law School, where he also served as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. During his 33-year Coast Guard career, Rear Admiral Baumgartner held various operational, legal, and logistics positions. As a Rear Admiral, Bill served as the Judge Advocate General Chief Counsel TJAG, of the Coast Guard from 2006 to 2010. As the Judge Advocate General, Bill directed the Coast Guard's worldwide legal program with over 250 attorneys. In this position, he was also the federal government's senior maritime attorney and dealt extensively with maritime regulatory law issues. From 2010 to 2013, he served as the 7th District Commander. Bill directed all U.S. Coast Guard operations in the Southeast U.S. and the Caribbean Basin. He directed the efforts of 12,000 Coast Guard members and volunteers charged with the whole array of Coast Guard missions. I'm Rear Admiral Bill Baumgartner in Florida. And the Coast Guard is responsible for about 1.8 million square miles of water area. Search and rescue, pollution response, commercial shipping. There are people smuggling narcotics, sometimes smuggling terrorists. And here in Florida, this is the most intense place for so many of those missions. Since retiring from the Coast Guard in 2013, his civilian career has included senior executive positions with Royal Caribbean International and Royal Caribbean Cruises, where he guided operation and maintenance of the world's largest consolidated fleet of cruise ships. Rear Admiral Baumgartner is the recipient of the Legion of Merit Award for meritorious conduct in the performance of services to the government of the United States in the global war on terror. Today, Baumgartner sits on the board of directors of the Seafarers House at Port Everglades, one of the world's leading seafarers welfare organizations. He is principal of Baumgartner & Associates, LLC, a corporate maritime regulatory consulting firm. One of my great pleasures when I was uh, the Judge Advocate General, the head lawyer of the Coast Guard in, um, in Washington, D.C., was to invite John Chimkus over to the Flagness. It was my congressman at the time. I was still a Collinsville resident uh, on paper, even though I lived uh, all over the world. That was a great uh, time to have lunch and look out the window over across Southeast Washington to the Capitol building. Two boys from a small town named Collinsville, and now some 30 years after graduation, you know, are sitting in the flag mess of the Coast Guard, looking out over the U.S. Capitol. It was a feeling that uh, is, is hard to describe. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Admiral Bill Baumgartner. Well, before I begin what I was going to say, anybody want to guess who was in the Southwest boarding line at uh, Washington Airport yesterday right in front of me? 
John Shimkus. So I should start out and say thanks, John, for inviting me to go meet that Coast Guard cadet back in uh, the fall of 1975. My life has uh, been forever changed. Well, back to the prepared remarks. Thank you so much for this honor. Uh, I'm humbled, and, and uh, it truly means the world to me. No matter how far away you might wander in life, there's nothing like recognition from your own hometown. And Mark, uh, thank you for that video. I hardly recognize the person in it if there were so many shots of somebody that was so young. <laughs> but anyway, um, I want to thank my wife, Christina. You've been an inspiration and a source of joy for me since we first met 15 years ago at a conference in Vienna, Austria, a little conference for lawyers looking at justice and rule of law in the world. My two daughters, Megan and Lisa, couldn't be here tonight. Megan, due to the demands of financial consulting business, uh, and Lisa, due to the academic rigors of being in her first year of veterinary school. Um, I love them deeply and immensely proud of them as they chart their way through life. I also want to thank and recognize uh, their mother, Rhonda, for helping make two wonderful daughters. Anybody's success really does begin at home, and I was quite fortunate there. My younger sister Becky and my younger brother Steve couldn't be here tonight, but I appreciate their love and support. My father John passed away 10 years ago in April. He taught me an immeasurable, immeasurable things about self-reliance and independence. He also taught me that if you can take it apart, you can probably get it back together again, and there's a good chance that it'll be, it will work if you're good at it. My mother Mary Lee, she's here tonight, sitting right over there. I think she knew more people in this room than I did. She's one of the most innovative and inventive people that I know. She taught us to challenge the world and make it our own. Just give you one example. When I was only five years old, she trained me and my older brother to sell Barbie doll clothes door to door. <laughs> we had a trained sales pitch our product case, and a marketing scheme. She made the Barbie doll clothes, and we didn't know two years later that that's where all of our Christmas presents came from. But she was not easy. We had to calculate our own commission, which was 10%. But this was just really the first of many entrepreneurial and other really interesting endeavors we had as we grew up. She brought her skills and innovative spirit to Unit 10, where she started teaching the fourth grade at Webster School the same year that I started high school. And in less than 10 years, she was teacher of the year for the entire unit 10. I owe you a lot, mom, and I'm so proud of you. Now, in my house, I had one special advantage growing up, and that special advantage is also here tonight. It's my brother, Mike. Mike is one year older than me, and he excelled at everything. Just trying to keep up with him pushed me harder than you would believe. And it allowed me to accomplish so much more in life than I ever could have on my own. So thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. I found a lot of challenge and innovation in other parts of life, and particularly Unit 10 as well. For example, my seventh grade teacher, Sandra Hanks, realized that I was a bit bored in her science class. She could have lectured me and told me to sit up, pay attention, stop doodling, and all that kind of stuff. But instead, she designed special projects for me to go and research and other kinds of experiments to, to conduct instead of sitting in class. And this really taught me that you can teach yourself, and you don't need to be in a classroom necessarily. And um, that stayed with me for many, many years. And in high school, I received a far better STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education than I realized. I thought I had just come from a small high school in, you know, in Illinois when I went out to the East Coast. But my background at uh, Council High School enabled me to test out of 17 semester hours of chemistry and calculus. That allowed me to have a, an entire additional engineering major, and I added marine engineering, and that has been with me almost every day since then. And in fact, that's a lot of what I do right now, still is, is marine engineering related. And I owe that to the uh, education that I got here at Collinsville High School. However, the most important aspect of what I got from Unit 10 was my development in the band program. 
Under the guidance of the longtime director, Neil Strebel, assistant directors Ed Hayes and Roy Stepfer, I learned so many things about perseverance, the pursuit of excellence, teamwork, poise, confidence, public speaking, organization, and leadership. I drew upon those lessons almost every day of my career. I can't thank them enough, and I can't thank them for what they've done for a thousand other students as well. And I'm so glad that several of my fellow band members are in the audience tonight. Vicki Rulicki, Beth Missy, Lisa Hartley, and I might be missing a few others. Um, I appreciate you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. As I reflect on what I've been able to accomplish in life, I know that I've been lucky in so many ways. I wasn't born with a silver smoot in my mouth, I don't mean that. But rather, there were opportunities available to me. They were designed for someone like me. When I applied myself, I could, could, see, could succeed, and I could be rewarded. In fact, I knew I would be rewarded. Unfortunately, others have a much more difficult road in front of them. My class at the Coast Guard Academy was the first to have women in it. I may have graduated at the top of my class, but my female classmates faced so many more obstacles than I did that merely graduating was a far greater accomplishment than anything I did there. At Royal Caribbean Cruises, I worked from people, with people from over 100 countries throughout the world, and I did business throughout the world. But all of that was conducted in English. I even did a symposium for Greek sh ship owners in Athens, and every word of it was in English. I was lucky. My best electrical engineer at Royal Caribbean wasn't so lucky. He grew up in Eastern Europe. They didn't have intensive English education, and his level of English would never allow him to advance, even though he was my best person. From all of this, I, I learned many lessons. Um, one thing I'm particularly proud of that I've tried to get back in that area, when I was the head lawyer of the Coast Guard, I implemented a policy that tried to reinforce this idea. I required every new attorney there to find at least one case where they were fighting the government. Even though they were government attorneys, I wanted them to learn what it was like to have to be an underdog and have to fight against when somebody much more powerful than you. Well, um, what I take from my career and my life thus far is that I was fortunate in so many ways, and I owe gratitude to those that helped me, but more importantly, I owe, and very humbly owe, generosity, understanding, and respect to those who must face so much more adversity and have to come overcome so many more challenges in their lives. Well, thank you again for this honor. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, I don't live in the Collinsville area anymore. There's not a lot of water around here other than the Mississippi River. <laughs> but it's still my home, and there's a feeling when I come back here that is just unlike anything else. And to be honored tonight is uh, something that uh, I really couldn't have dreamed of. Thank you again. Thank you, Admiral Baumgartner, for your remarks and your lessons. Next tonight, we have up an athletic inductee, Mr. Dennis Pace. When Dennis Pace graduated from Collinsville High School in 1965, he left behind a basketball legacy that included new state championship hardware in the school's trophy case. The 1965 Cahawk IHSA championship basketball team was led by six foot three inch center Dennis Pace. He averaged 25.6 points per game during their 30 and two season. The 1963 and 64 season had concluded with an upset loss in the super sectional that ended an undefeated season and the Cahawks hopes of a state title. Pace and his teammates under the guidance of legendary Cahawk coach Virgil Fletcher use dedication and perseverance as fuel to propel the next season, which many thought would be a rebuilding period into a championship year. Pace frequently led the Cahawks in points, making him a target for the opponent's defense. Despite their best efforts, Pace was able to score 112 points in the state tournament, 41 points against Lawrenceville in the super sectional, 27 against Lockport in the quarterfinals, 
and 29 against Chicago Marshall in the semifinals, followed by 15 against Quincy in the finals. Pace's successful free throw in the last two seconds of the title game clinched the championship for the Chaos, defeating Quincy 55 to 52. Now we're ready to resume play, going to the free throw line after drawing the foul is Dennis Pace, and this is almost an automatic point. This brilliant shooter, six foot three and senior from Collinsville. 14 points so far in this game. And that's 15. He was the 1965 state attorney's top scorer, missing the all-time record by just seven points and a unanimous choice for the all-tournament team. Mr. Dennis Pace. Dennis, uh, congratulations on the tournament. Thank you, sir. And uh, your victory. And I might add, and I think Coach Fletcher will probably agree, this kind of tells you what just the sort of young man this Dennis Pace is. Uh, I said, too bad, you fell seven short. And he said, it's all right, we got this. And he reached out and touched the trophy. You had a great tournament nonetheless. And uh, you're still the best 6'3 shooting center I've seen in a long time, Dennis Pace. Congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure watching you play. Good luck to you. For his outstanding senior year basketball performance, Dennis Pace earned all district and all state honors. He took his skills on the court to the University of Illinois, where he excelled in the classroom, earning both all Big Ten and all American academic honors. After college, Pace became a teacher in the O'Fallon School District and a volunteer basketball coach for the Cayhawks between 1981 and 1988. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Dennis Pace. Wow. Stephen McFall said he's gonna try to make me look good tonight. I didn't think he was trying to make me that good. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Obviously, it, uh, this is very, very emotional and outstanding evening for me, myself personally, and my family. Uh, well, I have my brother here who played for Collinsville. I have my son here who played for Collinsville. I had a daughter who was a cheerleader for Collinsville, and I married a cheerleader from Collinsville. So we're kind of a purple and white family. Uh, my journey to become a Cayhawk basketball player in the early 60s is a little different than the people that have been inducted as basketball players so far, and as my teammates, who are great players. Uh, I didn't play as a freshman. I didn't think I was good enough. I, I, co I played under the legendary Gus Salky at St. Peter and Paul with Jack Darlington, but Jack was the stud. I was just another kid that didn't do much. And uh, so that next year, after we went into our freshman year, I, I worked very hard in the summer, working, building homes and that with my family. Got a little stronger and bigger. And I played outside the high school at that concrete court with the metal nets that you all would drive by if you were still, if you were young in the 60s, you saw it there. And I became pretty, pretty good out there. But everybody said, you're good enough to play for Council, but you probably couldn't play organized basketball. And they probably were right at the time. So I just went on, didn't play freshman ball. Matter of fact, when I, you think about it and look at the records, there's only one player that's sitting over there that, that's not here tonight that played on our championship team that actually played freshman basketball that year, and that was Harry Parker. And so that, uh, that sophomore year, when I started out, I got bigger and stronger. I worked construction in the summer with my family. And uh, I'm in gym class, and a guy named Burt Weber, along with Virgil Fletcher, watching. And if you got anybody who was young at that time knows, everybody and anybody that could dribble a basketball or shoot it thought they were a basketball player in Collinsville at that time. The two things that were popular about Collinsville in the 60s, early 60s was Collinsville basketball, and if you walked down the street, any time at night, early evening, you heard Jack Buck and Harry Carey coming out of the phone home, home where they were broadcasting Cardinal baseball. If you didn't hear that, you heard the muffle of bouncing basketballs in somebody's lit court in the backyard because he was very popular because he had a basket and a lit court, and everybody was there to play. So I was playing one day, Burke goes inside after he was on the stage at Collinsville High School, and he brings out Virgil, at the end of the school that day, that was early, early in that school year, they called me in the office and asked me why I didn't play basketball. I said, well, I didn't think I was good enough. And Mr. Weber said, well, I think you're good enough. I want you to come out your sophomore year, this year. I said, yes, sir, I'll, I'll do that if you think I'm good enough. He said, I will. So he said, so I went out, 
And it became, I, I learned how to play organized basketball. Coach Weber took me under his wing. He said, at the end of that season, he said, Pace, I'm going to make an all-stater out of you. Now, when somebody says that to you, especially in a Collinsville, where you had Bethel and Redmond and Riddle and all the guys that came before me, bonus deal, that were fabulous basketball players, all-staters, all-American, all that, that does something to you. It makes you feel a little bit more proud about yourself and makes you want to do something a little more. Well, I didn't know exactly what he meant by that, but he said, when the season ended, and I, I had a great sophomore year, I thought, he says, be here tomorrow morning at 7.15. I thought, oh, he's going to teach me how to shoot basketballs or help me shoot more better or dribble or whatever. No, no, he got me there, and we, I walked out in my gym shorts and up to, up to the gymnasium. He took me out to the track, <laughs> and he had a clock, a stopwatch. He said, we're going to run a mile three days a week. I can't tell you how much I despise running without a ball. <laughs> Three days a week, but it, it actually built my stamina, and I, it developed me into a little stronger of a person. And the next years, we became more, I guess, mature physically in that. My only Achilles heel was, at that time, if you can picture this, I drove a 47 Plymouth. A 47 Plymouth at that time was about an inch shorter than a Cadillac. It's a little smaller than a bus. And it was very distinguished anywhere in town. If you knew where I was, you saw this 47 Plymouth because there weren't many of them around. As I started that sophomore year, if I had to describe myself, I said I was a pretty much of a free spirit. I enjoyed life. I always have and always will, and I still am. Virgil Fletcher was not a great proponent of free spirits. <laughs> And he had a lot of bird dogs out there. Uh, I worked construction this summer out of East St. Louis. More guys were picking tomatoes down at Keller's farm for 25 cents, and I'm making four dollars an hour. I got a pocket full of money. I got a car. Let me tell you, I'm somebody in '63, '64. <laughs> he didn't care for that, and so I didn't ever test him. I never did back talk or anything like that. But the thing you got to understand about Coach Fletcher, he didn't like long hair. He didn't like you having a girlfriend. He didn't like you to talk in practice. He didn't like you to drink water for some reason or another back in the <laughs> 60s. And so we, we, I mean, I never did really back talk, talk or anything, but he never felt that I was good enough. He knew, knew that Bert had took me under his wing and that, but he never felt I was good enough to play. But I matured. I was playing against a guy named Roger Bonesteel every night in practice. And I'm playing against a team that was undefeated from day one. They were number one in the state of Illinois that whole junior year. And come like we are right now in the month of February, basketball players get a little stale from all the hard practice and that. And I got put on the purple squad. And by putting on a purple squad, you take your white jersey off, flip it over to the purple side. Now you're playing with the varsity. I'm playing with Roger Bonesteel, Jack Darlington, and all the guys. And this is like on a Tuesday night. Wednesday night, I was on a purple squad. Thursday night, on a purple squad. Come Friday, we're playing St. Louis U in St. Louis, and it looks like I'm going to start. And, you know, this is, boy, I'm proud. I, my buttons are about ready to pop off the front of my shirt. And so I get to the game, and, you know, we were Blazers. We were the best-looking team to ever walk into a gymnasium. You knew who Collinsville was. We looked good. We played good, but we really looked good when we walked inside that gymnasium. Everybody knew us. Well, I get there, and I'm... I don't play JV ball that night. I sit in the stands with the varsity players. I'm starting, I'm getting a little nervous, but I get out there and we dress, we get out to the game, we practice. I'm one of the five guys shooting free throws knowing I'm starting that night. We get to the bench. He said, I changed my mind. More, you're back in the game. Pay, sit down. That, that's a little, a little damage to your humility right there. You know, most people might, might walk away, but uh, not only did I not play JV ball that night, not only did not start, I didn't get in that game. And like I said, the humility part, it, it's something inside me. I was the kind of person back then that you couldn't tell me I couldn't do nothing because I'm going to outwork you. And I said, I'm going to show this guy I'm a better player than he thinks I am. That happened twice that year. That he was going to start me. I never got in a game. So I came back that senior year. And well, that, well actually, the, that following of the junior year, Everybody had to come in and talk to him about what you're going to do in the offseason. 
I never was a guy that played basketball in the summer because I worked construction. I'd play outside on the asphalt court, but I didn't play with the guys that had open workouts. So he, uh, he said, Pace, you're going to run track. Well, good. I could jump. I could run. I'm pretty fast. Yeah, you're going to be a miler. Oh. <laughs> I told you I don't like running without a basketball. Well, any ball. You don't have any reason to run without a ball. And so he did. He took me. This is the last time I challenged Coach Fletcher. He took me to Roxanne Relays. And uh, there's 11 teams there, local teams, best relay in the area. What I'm doing there, I don't know why, because I'm the third miler on the team. I'm running a five-minute mile. we got guys running 526, 530. So it's time for the mile to start. You know, have you ever been to a track meet? Uh, first call for the mile run. First call for the mile run. Well, I know what's happening. I said, Coach, I'm having stomach problems. i got to go to the restroom. Well, the restroom was up in the school. i got to run up there. Well, I got there, and I just knew I was there in time that I could miss that mile run. <laughs> so I did. And they said, I heard a gun go off. I come back and I figure, boy, he's going to be mad. He's going to chew on me. I got there and he, calm as could be. I said, oh, sorry, coach, I had stomach problems. He said, I oh, know, that's all right, you're all right. He said, I got another event for you. Oh, good, good, okay. I said, well, what am I running? He says, you're fine, you're going to run mile relay. Mile relay, that's only one lap? <laughs> I just graduated, right? I'm happy. So I said, who's my runners with me? Well, they got ready for the mile relay. I didn't have anybody with me. They put me in the sixth lane, and the guy from Roxana comes up to me and says, you want the baton? I turn and I said, who am I going to give it to? <laughs> that was the last time I did anything to say anything about Coach Fletcher and try to back him in any way. But my whole life has been choreographed of what I've learned here in Collinsville, playing basketball. I've, the success I've, I've encountered in life is the things he taught me, the discipline, the respect for people, everything. I had fabulous teammates. They were all stars in junior high. I was just one of those guys that matured late, came on, and the sacrifices they made. They said that Virgil Fletcher's greatest decision as a coach in 65 is when he put Don Berger in the place of Lee Clark as a starter. And I have to disagree. I thought it was a great decision. Now, Don, I'm not, nothing personal. It was, it was a great decision. But then he put Steve Gown, who let, averaged 27 points a game. He was six foot in sixth grade with hair on his chest. He led both sides of the river. He put him at a point guard. He says, you're not shooting anymore. You're giving the ball to pace. That, well, I thought, was a good coaching decision. <laughs> but... The things, the way that things happen for us, you wonder why we won a state championship. You know, if, if you could write a book and understand that, you'd be a millionaire. But because of them guys sitting over there you're going to hear about in a little while, uh, it just a, it's a fabulous experience. You can't take away from any of them, myself personally. But the things I learned, I'll leave you with one last story, that how, how the discipline in my life that I learned from Council Basketball, and you probably have all experienced this. Uh, I'm down at Hardy's down here on 157. And I'm in line, you know, they don't have COVID, you couldn't get inside anymore. For some reason, they still can't get inside. And I love their chili, and they got great chili. And so the line's long, and I pull up my Tahoe, it's a big car, and there's a car in front of me. A little car comes behind me, and there's a gal in there. She's got stuff hanging from her rear view mirror. There's, oh, there's dolls, and there's dolls on her. On her. And, and she's, for some reason, she's upset. And she's... She's wondering what's going on in that line. So she starts beeping her horn. Now, you know, I learned discipline and respect from Coach Fletcher. But the guy in front of me thinks I'm doing this duty. <laughs> now, I was never one to walk away from a fight. But, you know, in most cases, if that would have been a guy back there, I probably went back there, opened the windshield, and explained to him he shouldn't do that anymore. But this gal keeps honking her horn. This guy's, you know, she's doing this stuff here and give me some kind of sign language. You've probably always seen it. Now, the guy in front of me is giving me a sign language. And, I go, mean, what am I going to do here? Well, we finally get up, and if anybody wants to make money here, you, you young people, invent an intercom that you can hear the person <laughs> on the other side that you know you're not going to get chef surprise when your hamburger or whatever you order comes to that window. So I get up there, and you see everybody's hanging out. And they're, 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 nobody can hear anybody. So I place my order. She's still honking. Off I pull. And I get up there to the window to pay. And I said, listen, I said, I'd like to pay for the car behind me. Oh, nice gesture. 
So sure enough, I paid for it. I said, just tell the people up at the counter that when I go up, because you, if you remember there, you know, they don't multitask at parties. You got a guy, person taking the money and you got a person serving your meal. So there's a little gap in between. So as you pull up, this gal went to pay and she saw she didn't pay. So, so instead of flipping me fingers and stuff, I was like, oh, thank you. oh God, thank you, oh, thank you. Yeah, wonderful, right? So I get up there and as the person gave me my meal, I said, can you give me the food for the person behind me? <laughs> And she said, well, sure, I, they said you paid for it. So as I'm driving away with her food in my car, I want to go back and see the face she's now has, that she's got to get back in line. Now, I learned some discipline from Council High School and Virgil Fletcher, and I was very competitive, but the last, the last thing I tell you is don't mess with old people, especially old K-Hawks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, free spirit, Dennis Pace. Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us to our next inductee of the evening, an athletic inductee, Mr. Kevin Stallings. Kevin Stallings graduated from Collinsville High School in 1978. Growing up with the backdrop of the basketball-centric Collinsville community, he developed a passion for the sport at a young age. Standing six feet, five inches, Stallings played guard for four years under the legendary coach Virgil Fletcher. During those years, Cahawk basketball won three conference championships. They were 30-1 and one in 1976-77 and lost to De La Salle Chicago in the first round of the Illinois State Tournament 67-66. Installing senior season, the Cahawks were 28 and 3 and finished third at state. They lost in the semifinals 55 53 to eventual champion Lockport Central. Stallings was named All State following both his junior and senior seasons and still holds records at Collinsville High School for career assists with 665, season assists with 284, and season steals with 146. After a year at Belleville Area College, where his team went 28 and 9, Stallings transferred to Purdue University, where he played college basketball for the Boilermakers from 1979 to 1982. After graduating from Purdue, Stallings capitalized on the valuable experience and insights he gained during his time on the court and transitioned into coaching. He started as an assistant coach at Purdue in 1982, working under his former coach, Gene Keedy. During that stretch, Purdue compiled a record of 140 and 44 won three Big Ten titles, and reached six consecutive NCAA tournaments, including a Sweet 16 appearance in 1988. After six years at Purdue, Stallings moved on to the University of Kansas, where he served as an assistant coach under head coach Roy Williams. While at KU, Stallings played a part in helping Kansas amass a record of 132 and 38, and four NCAA tournament appearances. Among those NCAA tournament appearances were two Final Fours, in 1991 and 1993. In 1993, Kevin Stallings took on his first head coaching position at Illinois State University. Over the next few years, he made a name for himself as a coach who could develop talent and lead teams to success. In his six years at ISU, the Redbirds appeared in two NCAA tournaments and two NIT tournaments. Stallings moved to Vanderbilt University in 1999, where he became the head coach of the Commodores. During his 17-year tenure at Vandy, Stallings achieved significant milestones, including multiple NCAA tournament appearances and an SEC tournament championship in 2012. His success at Vanderbilt solidified his reputation as a respected coach in college basketball. Stallings' fellow SEC coaches named him SEC Coach of the Year twice in the 2006-2007 season and again in the 2009-2010 season. In 2016, Stallings took on a new challenge when he accepted the head coaching position at the University of Pittsburgh. He announced his retirement from coaching in 2018. Kevin Stallings' coaching career is marked by his commitment to the sport, his ability to mentor players, and his strategic approach to the game. Unfortunately, Mr. Stallings fell ill and is not in attendance here this evening. So accepting on his behalf, we can't keep him off the stage, is Bob Bone. What did you say? I said, welcome to the stage. Thank you. I apologize for Kevin not being here, but he did send me a text today. I talked to him this morning after the last few days. He hadn't been feeling well. This morning he sounded terrible. 
coffin, and so he made the decision that he wasn't going to be able to make it. And he, he faxed, texted some stuff to me to read tonight. The great part about this is he keeps complimenting me of what a great player I was and how I was a better player than he was. <laughs> but let me read you the rest of it. I sincerely apologize for not being able to make it to the Hall of Fame ceremony. I would first like to say how humbled I am to be included in this class. It's not often that you get inducted in something with guys you idolized growing up. Kenny Overfeld, Tom Parker, and others. No, not Bob Bone. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank the following people. The com committee, obviously, for selecting me. My family for moving to Collinsville during my eighth grade year. It changed my life forever. The Salky family, particularly Gus Salky, our scorekeeper for treating me like a son and teaching me about the history of Collinsville basketball. Russ Smith and Robert Piggies, two of my buddies on the team that were older than me and looked out for me. They were the first guys to ever really tell me that I could be good and I always appreciated them for that. And finally, perhaps my life's greatest inspiration, Coach Virgil Fletcher. Every good thing that has happened to me in my adult life can be directly or indirectly traced back to him. I am the only person in a family of six kids to get a college education. I wanted to be a coach because of him. I wanted to impact life the ways he impacted mine. Things that I think and say still today are things that I heard from him say are things he taught me. He always used to tell me before a game, you either play to win or you play to lose, and at Collinsville we have to always play to win. I could not be more proud than to say I'm from Collinsville and that I'm a Kayhawk. I always used to say I'm a basketball player by choice, but a Kayhawk by the grace of God. Purple is still my favorite color, and I thank you again for this incredible honor. And that's from Kevin Stallings. I'm just going to tell a couple quick stories on Kevin that, that he was always uh, told when he was playing for Coach Fletcher. They were scrimmaging and they called, Coach called everyone in and Kevin was late going or going to get a basketball or something and he said he just felt something in his mind that there was something coming at him. Well, he kind of turns quickly and the ball goes flying by his head. Coach Fletcher had just fired the basketball, tried to hit him in the back of the head, and Kevin's dumbfounded. He didn't know what he had done or what, he, what, what to say, so he said he, he went home that evening, and his dad's sitting at the dinner table, and he's eating dinner, and Kevin says, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today at practice. And he said, Coach Fletcher tried to hit me in the back of the head with a basketball. He threw the ball at me, and luckily I ducked or would hit me right in the back of the head. And he's going on and on. And he said his dad never looked up from the dinner table, just kept eating. And he just said, well, Kevin, you need to find out why he threw that ball at you and correct it right away. <laughs> and that was the end of uh, his questioning the coach and what was going on. The last one I'll, I'll tell, I think it just exemplifies what, Kevin was, and what he thought of Coach Fletcher, when they won, I think it was his first Missouri Valley Conference tournament over at the at Keel. He took the watch they awarded to the championship team, walked right up the steps to where Coach Fletcher was sitting, handed him championship watch to Coach, and just turned around and walked, gave him a hug and turned around and walked back, which I just thought was a really classy maneuver by him. So... Kevin apologizes, like I said, for not being here, but he certainly belongs in this class and uh, was a great, great player while he was at Collinsville. I have one correction to make. I did not mention I skipped over Steve McFall's name when I was talking about my assistant coaches. So, Steve, I apologize for that. It won't happen again. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for sharing those remarks uh, for Mr. Stallings, and we'll trust that you can get that trophy to him, right? Please. Uh, and we don't need more photos of Bob, so. Uh, our next inductee this evening 
is an athletic inductee, Mr. Dominique Manley. From the very beginning of his high school career, 2010 Collinsville High School graduate Dominique Manley was delivering record-setting performances on the track. His records in the freshman sophomore 800 meter and distance medley relay continue to stand more than 15 years later. Those accomplishments were just the beginning of his outstanding Cahawk career. From a coaching standpoint, it's just it's incredible to have that level of athlete come through your program. He was an unspoken leader in terms of his physical ability. He, he worked hard, he was dedicated. Over the next four years, the middle distance runner would set varsity school records that still stand to this day in the 400 meter, the 800 meter, the four by 400 meter relay, the four by 800 meter relay, distance medley relay, and the sprint medley relay. He is fifth all time in the 1600 meter at Collinsville High School. Manley earned varsity letters in both cross country and track. Dominique Manley was a two time 800 meter and one time four by 800 meter relay champion in Madison County and a four by 400 meter Southwestern Conference relay champion. He made three appearances in the 800 meter at IHSA State, finishing 22nd in 2008, third in 2009, and first in 2010. Collinsville, Dominique Manley. The race is still Daniel Mazars of Edwardsville. As we go to the north curve, Mazar with the lead. Second place now to Collinsville. It's Collinsville and Edwardsville. Collinsville and Edwardsville. This one's going to Dominique Manley. Dominique Manley. His 800 meter championship time was one minute, 52.30 seconds. You know, his junior year, when he placed at state, we were like, you know, he can probably do pretty well next year with the competition. We knew there was a really good runner at Edwardsville, and that's who he passed to win the state championship. Dominique got along with everybody. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, on the relays, he was more of the relaxed, fun-loving guy, but when that gun went off, uh, he, he was there to compete, and he showed it. Manley continued his track career at Kansas University, where he competed individually as a part of a Jayhawk relay teams. He competed in the 800 meter and 4x440 meter and two mile relays outdoors, and the 600 yard, 500 meter, 800 meter, and 4x800 meter relay indoors. He had appearances in the Big 12 indoor and outdoor championships and NCAA West preliminary round. Post college, Manley is still an avid runner. He works in cyber system security, has been a constituent services representative for the U.S. House of Representatives, and a trainee in the U.S. Air Force Reserves. Please, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Dominique Manley. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be standing here before you and the other inductees uh, today to be recognized for my accomplishments as a competitor. I'm proud to have the opportunity to be part of a long tradition of exceptional people who have accomplished so much in their lives and careers. Thank you to the Hall of Fame committee for making my dream a reality. Uh, the committee has done a great job of pointing out my various accomplishments, but there are so many people who have helped me along the way. To my, my parents and grandparents, words can I express what you mean to me. I'll never forget the years of sacrifice and support. Uh, and to my unofficial coach, my grandfather, <laughs> he, will always, um, he always likes to remind me of the early days of running and holding his pocket uh, when getting started around the neighborhood. And then uh, from there, I went on to the Police Athletic League in Nashville. And then uh, one of my first miles, I ran uh, holding up my shorts with one hand <laughs> and uh, running with the other. Uh, some of the people I'd like to thank who helped me along the way, uh, some of my coaches over the years, uh, Coach Wynn from Nashville, Coach Cox and Coach Casper from Collinsville Middle School. Uh, Coach Casper has kept in contact with me for the last 20 plus years, uh, so I, I really appreciate the support. Uh, Coach Frecker, uh, you provided me with the necessary tools, tools to accomplish my goals over, over my career. I'd also like to thank Coach Redwine uh, from the University of Kansas uh, as he helped me further my collegiate uh, career or, or compete on the collegiate level. 
Uh, and then uh, also Coach Al Joyner, uh, who uh, enabled me uh, to go and train out in California uh, for a while. I'd also like to uh, thank my teachers, administrators, and all those at uh, Collinsville Unit District 10 uh, who uh, helped me uh, to um, uh, progress in my uh, academics as well. And then also, uh, I, I'd like to give a shout out to the Key Club who also provided their supportive swag uh, later in the season as we moved into championship season. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my family, uh, to include my wife, Leah, uh, my two children, Mia and Miles, uh, and once again, thanking my grandparents, uh, brothers, sisters, and uh, family friends uh, who, who have always uh, supported me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. That was on cue. Hey, they might be ready to go. <laughs> Congratulations, Dominique. And our next inductee this evening is an athletic inductee, Mr. Tom Parker. A 1968 graduate of Collinsville High School, Tom Parker gave Cahawk fans something to watch when he scored 25 points in his very first varsity game during his sophomore year. He ended that season by leading the team in scoring with a total of 549 points for an average of 19.4 points per game. He also led in rebounds with a total of 220. At six feet, six inches tall, Parker was the starting center every year of his high school career. During the 1966-67 season, his junior year, Parker led the team in all aspects. He scored 603 points for an average of 19.4 points per game and 279 rebounds. However, his senior year was his most outstanding. Parker scored an amazing 889 points in 27 games for a record average of 32.9 per game. As a Cahawk, Tom Parker set multiple records that stand today. Best point average in one season, best career point average, most field goals in a game, most field goals in one season, most career field goals, most career shots taken, most career rebounds, and most career defensive rebounds. When he completed his years at Collinsville High School, Parker had scored 2,041 career points, earned All-State honors three times, and was named an All-American his senior year. Parker chose the University of Kentucky as his college. His standout performance continued as a Wildcat. Hollenbeck down to the far side. Off to Parker, got the shot. At Kentucky, he averaged 17.5 points as a junior and 18 as a senior. He was named All-SEC First Team, Academic All-SEC Team, and Co-SEC Player of the Year. In 80 career games at the University of Kentucky, Parker scored 1,238 points and grabbed 660 rebounds. At the end of his collegiate career, Tom Parker was selected by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the sixth round, 83rd overall, in the 1972 NBA Draft, but did not pursue professional basketball. Parker ultimately became an educator in Lexington, Kentucky. In 2013, the Post-Dispatch named him to the third team of the 50 years all-time All-Metro basketball team. Accepting on Mr. Parker's behalf tonight is Jack Parker, and please listen to a message from Tom, who is unable to attend this evening. The first thing I'd like to do, though, is I've, I've got to mention two mentors of mine growing up, and that's my brother Jack and my brother Harry. They not only helped me in my basketball career, but also uh, in learning the, the game of baseball. And then I want to mention Jack's sons, Kent and Mark, who had nice careers at Collinsville. And Kent's a, a medical doctor at Barnes Hospital, and Mark is a judge uh, in the state of Illinois. And also, uh, I want to mention my grandson, Jack, Jack Medalli. Jack is a freshman at the Naval Academy. He's getting plenty of playing time as a freshman and uh, doing quite well. There are four people that impacted my life greatly. And I'll start with Coach Scheibel. The beautiful thing about playing for Coach Scheibel is he provided leadership in getting me ready for uh, high school basketball with Coach Fletcher. And then moving forward to, to coach with Coach Fletcher, not only one of the greatest coaches of all time in Illinois, but also in the nation. The, the third person I want to mention is Coach Hall, Coach Joby Hall. Coach Rupp, uh, again, a great coach. 
that transition to playing for Coach Rupp wasn't easy, but it did help me greatly in being able to, to play at Kentucky. I also want to mention a, a longtime friend of mine that we went through school together. That's Fred Bloomberg. Fred had a, a beautiful corner shot. He did some great things and was also played great defense as well. I'm extremely humbled and honored to be a part of, of this. Uh, I'm thinking of the people that are in or about to go, to go into the Hall of Fame. You know, I think of Bogey Redmond coming to my practices and practicing with the team at the Collinsville Gym. And then I'm thinking of Denny Pace that's coming in. Denny, uh, what a beautiful jump shot he had and a great leader on, on the 1965 championship team. I feel honored and blessed to, to be inducted and to uh, earn this award, and, and I want to thank, thank you all for considering me and allowing me to be a part of this. Okay, congratulations again to Tom and Jack. Thank you for accepting his award on his behalf. That takes us to our next inductee this evening. This is a distinguished inductee, Mr. John Renfro. John M. Renfro grew up in Collinsville, Illinois with a recognizable family name. He was the seventh generation of Renfros to reside in the community, and his father, John A. Jack Renfro, was superintendent of schools. Years later, his business career brought international recognition to his name and the Collinsville community. Born elsewhere, when John was young, his father brought the family back to Collinsville after years spent teaching and coaching in other Illinois communities. A 1978 graduate of Collinsville High School, Renfro was a member of National Honor Society and Science Club, officer of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and captain of the cross country and track teams. After graduation, he attended Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Renfro soon discovered a keen interest in business and pursued a bachelor's degree in administrative sciences. He graduated SIUC in 1982 and entered the leadership development program at Caterpillar in Peoria, Illinois. In the following years, Renfro held increasingly responsible human resources management positions at major corporations, Ameritech, A.C. Nielsen International, Dun & Bradstreet, Zenith Electronics, and Gateway Inc. As his duties expanded, he gained experience managing human resources throughout the Asia Pacific region, Africa, and Latin America. In 2002, John Renfro was named Senior Vice President of Human Resources for the Walt Disney Company. In this role, he reported directly to Robert A. Iger, President and Chief Operating Officer, and Michael D. Eisner, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. He was responsible for 130,000 people in 172 countries and managed Disney's employee communications, culture and organization development, employee education and development, staffing, diversity, compensation and benefits, and employee relations. Following his time at Disney, Renfro became Vice President of Human Resources at Hewlett Packard Company, was Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resource Officer for AECOM Technology Corporation, and Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Capital Group. Since May 2020, Renfro has been a member of the Executive Advisory Board and founding member of Semper Virens Venture Capital in California. John Renfro received the Alumni Achievement Award and served as graduation speaker at SIUC in 2003. He is a member of the SIUC Business Alumni Hall of Fame. Renfro's professional trek has taken him through Chicago to Sydney, Australia, and California. He amassed human resources experience in more than 50 countries. However, as a proud native of Collinsville, Illinois, his hometown is mentioned often and never far from his mind. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. John Renfro. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Brad, Clay, Mark, and the entire selection committee for this evening. It's an honor to follow my father's induction. I wanted to say my mom did a beautiful job. Mom turns 90 in three months. I thought she did a fantastic job. I'm thrilled to be here, and congratulations to the other recipients, both this year and last. I wanted to spend a few moments on my dad. When I was in the fourth grade, over 50 years ago, I learned we were moving from the south side of Chicago in the late 60s to Collinsville, my dad's hometown. His mom lived here, and we were looking to come back. But at that time, I was the oldest of four. 
My dad had been a high school coach at multiple schools in a high school in Chicago on the South Side and became a principal. But at that early age, it was really influential on me. I had such wonderful memories of being with him as he coached. You know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, being on the court, sitting on the bench, you know, being in the dugout, on the field, in the locker room, listening to those halftime discussions and watching and learning at every event. He was such a determined coach and mentor and I loved feeling truly his joy was coaching and competition. And that stuck with me my entire life till today. So we were off, we were off to Collinsville. I remember the special times from previous visits we had, running up Monk's Mound, watching the arch be built. I was always concerned that both legs of the arch wouldn't quite meet at the top. I learned from relatives about our family heritage over the multiple generations back to the very early 1800s. Collinsville's first resident, I believe, was in 1800, and I had a seventh grandfather that came in 1810. It was an exciting adventure indeed. Collinsville has a special place in history. Actually, the ancient Native American city of Cahokia of 900 years ago was soon to be one of the one of 25 World Heritage Sites across the US, across the entire US. I was impressed by that and really enjoyed watching the archeology span and being part of that community. Even where we are right now tonight, Madison County, created a few years after my relatives arrived Back in 1812, Madison was founded, and it stretched from here through Chicago and Wisconsin to the Canadian border. I think few people realize that. We were significant over the years, this place. This is truly an important and special community in our history, but I quickly learned it was much more than history and a place, it was about the people of Collinsville. So we planted our roots here, and the teachers, the coaches, the community members provided a foundation and opportunity for me to grow and our family to grow. I had such great memories at Columbian School, North Junior High, and at the high school. I enjoyed school and sports, but it was tough chasing my dad's track records for four years in the 100 and 220 because my times never got close, so I ran the 440. I had a broad range of summer jobs, you know, in high school and college, from those influential days of learning how to work hard at McDonald's hamburger line to the city water and sewer departments here. You know, I laid miles of asphalt with McClare Asphalt. I painted, painted many local homes and even broke my back picking horseradish one summer. I gained confidence from my family, my great friends, our church group. My mom and dad were role models and always interested, inquisitive, and encouraging of me. After college and into the corporate world, I married my best friend, Robin Robison. Robin was a 79 grad here, and we had three wonderful sons. She had a short career, but very successful, and then dedicated her life to raising our three boys and supporting me in the life of a corporate person. We had many moves ahead. Frequent corporate moves for new opportunities and new roles. We moved many times from here to Chicago, Chicago to Sydney, Australia. I commuted from Hong to Hong Kong from Sydney, Australia for a year. We moved to California, quickly San Diego to LA to San Francisco. These were very challenging times. Corporate roles are brutal and unrelenting. But we viewed it as an adventure throughout our family. We didn't complain, we viewed it as an adventure. 
So over a 40-year career at companies like Disney, HP, and Gateway, as you've heard, my wife Robin has been a tremendous supporter and partner and champion for our entire family. Our sons were always energized and enthusiastic, which made it possible and positive for our family. In my corporate roles, I always led the people dimension of the business strategy. That's what human resources is. Worked for the CEO and focused deeply in that area. But looking back and in work as it is in life, it's about the people. Here it's the teachers, the coaches, the neighbors, the parents, the friends who invested in me along this exciting path. The support and love of my entire family was felt at every step. My parents, who were engaged, grounded, as well as our school and Collinsville community, helped instill in me the Midwest values of hard work, integrity, and the value of family and faith. Thank you for this thoughtful award tonight. I'm honored and humbled and appreciate the opportunity to join the Cahawk Hall of Fame. Thank you to the district, the community, my family, my wife Robin of 40 years now, my sons Christian, Justin, and Joshua, my mom, and I know my dad's watching, for being here tonight. I'm a Cahawk, I always will be, and Collinsville will always be my hometown. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Renfro. That takes us to our next inductee of the evening, a distinguished inductee, Captain Brenda Holdener. Retired U.S. Navy Captain Brenda Holdener graduated from Collinsville High School in 1978. She was active in athletics at CHS, including volleyball, track, and basketball. She was a member of the first Lady Cahawks basketball team. After graduation, she enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1980, she received a Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps NROTC, scholarship. She was commissioned as an ensign in the U.S. Navy in 1985 and completed Naval Flight School training in 1988, earning the wings of gold as a Naval Helicopter Pilot. Holdner completed Naval Flight School training as a helicopter pilot alongside her brother, Michael A. Holdner, also a 1978 CHS graduate. They were the first brother-sister team to complete Navy Flight School together. She graduated with honors from Oregon State University in 1985 with a BS in Construction Engineering Management, graduated from the Naval War College in 2000 with an MA, National Security and Foreign Affairs, and graduated from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs in 2002 with a graduate certificate in Homeland Security. Captain Holdner was deployed with the Navy multiple times on a variety of ships to the Mediterranean, Northern Atlantic, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, as well as Japan, Korea, Guam, and Australia in the Pacific Theater. Her assignments included combat helicopter pilot, navigator on the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower and USS Kitty Hawk, and command center director for the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. In 2001, she became the commanding officer of Helicopter Combat Support Squadron 2, HC2, a helicopter squadron with 450 personnel and 14 H3 helicopters. Captain Holdner became the 17th commanding officer and first female commander of the USS Wasp, a multi-purpose amphibious assault ship in 2010. Twice during her long career, Captain Holdner notably participated in congressional hearings. Her first appearance was related to the Navy's involvement in Operation Desert Storm. In 1991, she was part of a panel discussion regarding the combat exclusion law, which prohibited women from serving in combat positions. So I am very selfish in the opinion that I would like to see it change just because that would afford me more opportunities. Can the women do the job in a combat arena? I feel yes, and I personally feel that it, uh, I'd like to see it changed. The law was subsequently overturned. She was inducted into the Oregon State University Academy of Distinguished Engineers in 2013. Captain Holdner retired from the U.S. Navy in 2014 after 31 years of active military service. Captain Holdner was also the recipient of the 2022 Collinsville High School Alumni Achievement Award and spoke at the Collinsville High School commencement ceremonies that year. It's great to be here. Look at this sea of purple. Go Cahawks! Right, woo! Yeah. 
and uh, congratulations to the graduating class of 2022. Woo! Yes. Go forth, prosper, show respect to others, and be kind to others. The universe will take care of you only if you let it, but you must take the first step. Namaste. Today, she lives in Alaska, where she spends time hiking, kayaking, and camping. She also serves as a whale-watching boat captain and guide. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Captain Brenda Holdener. You all will be happy to know I do not have prepared remarks. <laughs> okay, first off, I would just like to say I am very humbled and honored to be standing up here and be a part of the esteemed group of people that are Council High School Hall of Famers. Uh, that's just pretty amazing. And so I just wanna say thank you. Thank you to the Hall of Fame Committee. Thank, thank you to the uh, Education Board of Directors. Thank you to uh, uh, the Unit 10 District. I mean, this is pretty amazing. It's one of those things that I would say never in my wildest dreams would I thought I would be standing here being a Hall of Famer. But I really have to thank one person, and this is gonna make my uh, speech really short is that uh, I wanna thank Michael Barsh, retired science teacher, uh, <laughs> retired Navy senior chief in the Naval Reserve, because if it wasn't for him putting my name in front of somebody in Council High School, I still would have just been a pitcher in the yearbook. So thank you, Michael. All right, again, I'm humbled and honored. Thank you all for being here, and thank you so much for this uh, award. I appreciate it. Thank you, Captain Holdener, and thank you for your example. That brings us to our final inductee of the evening. They are athletic inductees, the 1965 boys basketball team, coached by Virgil Fletcher and assistant Frank Patol, along with team members Dennis Arnold, Mike Belabradic, Don Berger, Jack Darlington, Bruce Evans, Steve Gowan, Dennis Pace, Harry Parker, Mike Vincent, and Keith Seisel. The 1964-65 Kayak basketball season was supposed to be a rebuilding year after an upset loss in the Super Sectionals into the 1963-64 season. However, everything came together in the winter of 1964-65 to bring home Collinsville High School's second state basketball championship. Under the leadership of legendary Collinsville basketball coach Virgil Fletcher and assistant coach Frank Patol, the 65 team occurred a 30-2 season, 12-0 conference record, and that state championship. The 1964-65 team demonstrated grit and perseverance, as well as historic command of Fletcher's famous ball press defense. However, the championship season could not have happened without offense provided by All-State center Dennis Pace, forward Don Berger, and guards Jack Darlington, Steve Gowan, and Harry Parker. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 1965 State High School Championship basketball team from Collinsville. Keith Zizel's got his arm wrapped around that uh, trophy over there, and I don't believe anybody will be able to get it away from him. Pace averaged 25.6 points per game that year, and individually provided 112 points in the state tournament games. The turning point in the season came on December 19th after a three-point loss to Decatur MacArthur in a game that Coach Fletcher described as the worst performance in school history. Under Fletcher's unrelenting direction on how to anticipate where the ball was going, the team regrouped and set a school record for steals. 1965 state champion Cayhawks are remembered for their teamwork and tenacity. They played together with the common goal of victory, not personal performance or accolades. This is off to the side. And the run signs to end the ball game. Collinsville wins the state championship 55 to 52. And look at them go wild. Over the ensuing years, the players have credited Coach Fletcher with having them prepared for whatever might happen during a game. This fine coach has been at Collinsville for 19 years, and during this period of time, he has brought eight teams to Champaign. In 1961, one of the finest high school teams ever to play at the University of Illinois won the state championship. And now in 1965, 
history has repeated itself. Congratulations to you. Congratulations, boys, for winning this Pelican Town to a great basketball team. How's that? The 1964-65 boys basketball team had coach Virgil Fletcher, assistant coach Frank Patol, players Denny Pace, Mike Vinson, Jack Darlington, Keith Zeisel, Harry Parker, Dennis Arnold, Steve Gowan, Bruce Evans, Don Berger, and Mike Bella Braden. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage members of the 1965 basketball team. And speaking on their behalf is Mr. Stephen Gowan. Good evening. First, I'd like to uh, thank the following and recognize the following people. Our cheerleaders, Lynn Ackerman, Granger, Diane Bloomer, Diane DeMauro, Barbara Fowler-Pace, Chris Kaiser, Judy Roshke hart and Jane Okus-Green. Second, our team managers. Yes. Second, our team managers, Tom Nascono, Rich Tiger-Lyons, and Frank Mitchell, as well as other team members who could not be with us tonight, Harry Parker, Mike Vincent, Mick Bell Bradick, Bruce Evans, and Dennis Arnold. And of course, all of our 1965 classmates. <clears throat> I left these cap grounds some 52 years ago. I have, may have left Collinsville, but Collinsville has never left me. Some of us have traveled from faraway lands to be here tonight. As I look out over this great room, I see many decades of Coach Fletcher's extended family, players, friends, and community supporters. For those of you that stayed by and cared for our coach and his wife, I and my fellow tribesmen say thank you. For the youth of today, I hope that the story that I'm about to tell about the 1965 basketball championship team both energizes and, and inspires you for your future. Yes, sometimes dreams do come true. To understand our 65 team, you first must look back at the previous years. As has been stated tonight, the year before, we were 28 and one lost one game in the super sectional to Centralia, which we also did the year before, lost to Centralia in the super sectional. But more importantly, we lost our star, Roger Bonensteel. Roger had been a standby star for us for three years. That is the main reason that people were looking to the 64-65 year as a rebuilding year. Roger had been the go-to guy, and at that time, coming back, we did not have a go-to star that led our team, at least not yet. Collinsville was used to having someone of that, mag uh, that marquee value that basically would lead the team. Roger had been All-State 62, 63, 64, and an All-American in 64. Before that, we've heard the name tonight, Terry Bethel was basically an All-State in 56 and 57 and the first All-American on the basic, the uh, uh, Parade magazine. He was the first player chosen for the All-State for that basically magazine in 1960, 57. As well as Tom Parker, who we all heard about, who was All-State in 66, 67, and 68, and an All-American in 68. We did not have that type of big-name player coming back. 
there had been that type of supporters and that type of players coming from Collinsville that year, even though our team had been undefeated as freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, our 64-65 team had not yet earned our identity. However, th that wasn't the major, major problem that we had with regards to uh, the addition, not having the name player. The main problem was, wasn't the major factor that we encountered in the, in the beginning of the year is that we lost not only Roger, but we lost Coach Fletcher. I don't know how many of you in here tonight know, but Coach Fletcher, Fletcher was hospitalized the first part of January for an extended period. Frank Patol took over from him and led the team for several weeks during Coach Fletcher's absence. Upon Coach's return, he took over the team again and we continued winning. The problem was Coach Fletcher had been uh, treated for exhaustion, high blood pressure, and stress. At the time, I didn't know that coaching Denny Pace did that to you. <laughs> I remember Coach calling, it, calling me into the office, indicating how, you know, what he wanted to do in running the team, but in essence, he was gone. He didn't say he was going to be gone. There was no notice. He just left. And that's when Coach Patol took over. And Coach Patol was an outstanding mentor for all of us, but especially that year in Coach Fletcher's absence. As luck would have it, our last game of the season was against Quincy at Quincy. There were 4,200 standing room only fans at that game. They were a very good team. And that basically gave us some idea of how to play them finally in the finals. <clears throat> Going into the state tournament, Collinsville was ranked the number one team in the nation. No, 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 no. Huh? no. Who, who was it? You're having a senior moment. Oh, no. oh that, was, that was a 61, 61. team. Damn, oh, okay, okay. Oh, I, I, Fred, Fred, I'm sorry. That, that, that's the 61 team. Okay, 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 let me do this again. Okay. Starting into the tournament, UPL, U, the UPI had us ranked in February. They had Pekin, which was the defending state champion, number one, Thornton, number two, and Collinsville, 12. In March, they had switched. Basically, Thornton had taken over number one, Pekin was number two, and Collinsville had shot up to number 11. <laughs> we won the regional tournament against Madison, 70 to 62. In the sectional tournament, again, we defeated Belleville for the third time that year, 63 to 52, 57. And then the super sectional, we played a very good Lawrenceville team at Olney. Now, I believe if you go back and you look, Lawrenceville was probably rated higher than we were and was expected to beat us. Jack Darlington, our team captain, hit the first basket over his own defense from the corner. Then the next two plays, basically there were lob passes to Dennis Pace at the rim, which he put in. That game set the stage for our success at Champaign. That game, Dennis was basically 18 for 21, scored seven free throws for a total of 43 points. He had 12 baskets the first half. How would you have liked him regarding him, Fred? That put Denny in, in place to basically challenge the scoring record of 121 points. And bottom line is that, that he had 43 going into the three games that you play at state. Our first game at Champaign was against uh, Pure, uh, which was against um, Lockport Central. And Lockport Central was a tall team. Their players were 6'2", 6'2", 6'3", 6'5", and 6'7". You can see how tall we are. Okay. Lockport had defeated Pekin 
and Pekin had beat them earlier in the year by 27 points. So you could see how Lockport was rising with regards to their play. Bill Ford was their main player. He was 6'5", he scored 20 points against Pinkin and had 13 rebounds. Jack and I were at midcourt when they came out to, play, uh, to do layups. We were doing our layups and we looked at them and Jack looked at me and I looked at him and we said, oh boy, we're in for it again tonight. I remember eight of their guys dunking it. I'm not sure about eight, but let's say over half of their guys would dunk the ball. We had two guys on our team that could dunk the ball. This guy and Mike Vincent, who's not with us tonight, but Mike had just pulled his arm out at the, at the Lawrenceville game out of the socket, and he was in no way to play or certainly not to dunk the ball. <clears throat> As expected, Lockport out-rebounded us, 37 to 25. However, Lockport did have a weakness. They couldn't handle Fletcher's press. They had 23 turnovers, and that's how we basically scored a lot of our points that game. We had three turnovers the whole game, and we beat them basically, what's the score? 70 to 45, 25 points. Denny had 29, as expected. Jack had 19, as expected. Harry Parker, eight, and Donnie Berger, eight. Locksport's Ford had 14 points at half, and their coach was asked why he didn't score more after the first half. He ended up with 20 points. I saw this in the paper. This is exactly what he said. He said the Lockport coach was asked, and then he said, the coach said, his reply was, Bill got his dauber down because he was basically taken to the the woodshed with regards to Dennis Pace, and he got mad, so he wasn't going to score anymore. Now, can you imagine a player playing for the state championship indicating that he was basically demoralized because of this guy back here? <laughs> but he did. That's exactly what the coach said. <clears throat> Nix was Marshall the most skilled team, in my opinion, that we played. We had them at 12-15 on Friday, on Friday afternoon. They were very athletic. Marshall was much more quicker. They were good shooters, and they could press. We played them, and they were just more athletic. One of their players was Richard Bradshaw, who ended up at the University of Kansas. He was 6-3, and basically, I was in for a rebound, six foot, going up, and I see somebody's chest right about here. <laughs> and he got the ball, either put it back in or got the rebound and went back down. I don't know about that. But he ended up playing for Kansas. And as a sophomore in 67, 68, he led the team in rebounding from the guard position. That tells you how athletic these guys were. However, we had the answer for Marshall that game. The answer was Harry Parker and Don Berger. Don had 20 points that game, and Harry ended up with 14. Obviously, then, Darlington had eight, and Denny had his normal, usual 29. So that set the stage for us to basically play Quincy. Out of 736 schools that played and entered the tournament that year, Collinsville ended up playing Quincy versus Collinsville, just like it was the last game of the year. Quincy's lineup was 6'8", 6'3", 6'3", 6'3", and 5'9". Again, you can see. The rest is history. We beat Quincy 55 to 52. Darlington ended up with 17. He was our high point man. Uh, then we had Berger at 11, we had Parker at 8, and Denny basically had 15. For the tournament, Collinsville averaged 52% shooting 
and 80% from the free throw line. For the four game total, we averaged 70 points a game and 54 points against the opponents, the opponents average. For our yearly averages that year, we had 72 points versus 57. So we were within the range of what we normally scored. Then he ended up with 114 points that he was credited with, seven points shy of the state tournament record, which was set in 1953. At the end of the tournament, our team had accomplished three achievements. One, we had won the Illinois High School State Basketball Championship. Two, we now had earned our identity for the Collinsville community. And second, Collinsville had found their superstar in Dennis Pace. I would like to say something specific about Harry Parker. Harry Parker died in 2012 at 64. I would like to say that all of us were better athletes, but the best athlete on our team was Harry Parker. Harry was a cross country runner, but more than that, he was a baseball player that could play basketball. Harry was drafted out of high school at F-17 in the first amateur draft in 1965, and he was throwing 90 miles an hour when it wasn't popular in high school. Um, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals twice. He played for the New York Mets, and he also played for the Cleveland Indians. His record with the Mets was 8-4 and 3.35 and in the year that they won the National League Championship, and he was an integral part of that team. The Cahawks, basically when we came back home, there were all-star game, all-star teams that were selected. And I don't know if before or if it happened after any of this, but bottom line is we had our first, our five starting players were all selected for the Metro East All-Star Squad. Pace and Darlington were on the first team, Berger was on the second team, and Harry and I were on the fourth team. The second thing I'd like to mention that we're proud of is during 2022, the Illinois Basketball Association was holding a historic night of basketball at the Old Herald Brewery. And the purpose of the event was to raise money for the Coaches Association, which was gonna have their mu museum up in Bedford Park, Illinois. Basically, one of the people that was gonna be there was the museum director Bruce Vertura, and the cha chairman of the museum, and he was going to have a speaker by the name of Pat Heston, who he, he considered to be the most intellectual uh, uh, notoriety with regards to the history of Illinois basketball, and he was going to speak. At that meeting, Heston asked Fletcher, he, he told people, that he asked Fletcher, who was, what was the best team that you ever coached? And Fletcher responded without hesitation, the 1965 team. Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, when we were winning the championship in 61, I knew that it was our players' greatest experience and thrill at the time, as it was his. I feel I may have honored more of the accomplishment for the 1965 team because the team was a surprise to us. The team was, on, was one out of desire, pride, and was the greatest, and this is the main part, the greatest example of teamwork that I've ever seen on the floor. That came from Coach Fletcher. I can't tell you how proud we are to have those compliments from coming from Coach Fletcher who we consider to be one of the best coaches of his era, if not all eras in the state of Illinois coaching. <clears throat> I would like to congratulate the Consul Community Unit School District number 10. 
as well as all of those that selected us for this honor tonight. It's, it's great, it's truly appreciated. I would also like to recognize the district and I'm certain others in the community for reviewing the history, for reviving the history of Collinsville. Today when many communities and other institutions are under pressure from outside groups to tear down, rewrite, or eliminate their history altogether, Collinsville has chosen to recognize and honor its past for the benefit of current and future generations of Collinsville citizens. <laughs> History of our past speaks to us about inspirational stories that foster greater and brighter dreams for tomorrow's youth to embrace. I can speak to you about such dreams. Jimmy Selke, I, with you and, and your team of 1957, inspired me to basically want to play basketball at Collinsville High School. I was nine years old. How could we all not be inspired by the great 1961 team, which was all everything, with Bogey Rebin and Fred Riddle? And then I was inspired, and I was basically 13 at that age. Then when I was 15, I was inspired by Coach Fletcher and Coach Patol, who basically, and, fi and five high school teammates that came together as one in 1965. Those teams that we played were, we beat, they were good at shooting, they were good at rebounding, they were good at pressing, but basically that night they played the 65 Cahawks, they got beat 30 times that year. Now I'd like the audience to basically help me close out the presentation. When I point to you, I would like for you to say, go Cahawks. <laughs> Can we, let's try, practice that once. Okay, that's good for the first try. <laughs> Just like Fletcher, though, well, let's do it again. Go Cahawks! All right, I think we're there. <laughs> our team's hope is that some of our young people person's dreams begin tonight and that, that those dreams come true, not just in basketball, but by becoming inspired from watching and learning from all of tonight's inductees that have earned entry into the Cahawk Hall of Fame. Yes, we consider our team to have been blessed, or fortunate, or both, to have played here at Collinsville and to have played in 1965 with coaches Virgil Fletcher and Frank Patole. In closing, the one constant sometimes will never change, something that will never change, that is that the Collinsville Cahawks will always be remembered as the 1965 State of Illinois High School Basketball Champions. Once a Cahawk, always a Cahawk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gowan, for your remarks, and thank you again to the entire 1965 basketball team, and congratulations. So thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Please mark your calendars for the next Hall of Fame induction ceremony to be held on February 13th, 2025. Nominations for the Hall of Fame class of 2025 will open this summer on June 1st. In addition, all of the videos from this evening will be available for viewing in the Hall of Fame area at Collinsville High School, on the Collinsville CUSD 10 YouTube channel, and on the district website within just a few days. For all of our inductees, I did want to mention we do have boxes for your awards, for your trophies, and so if you would like a box to take yours home, please come back up to the stage in just a moment and we'll give you a box for that. 
Lastly, lastly, thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you for coming. The breadth of the accomplishments on display tonight makes me proud to be a Cayhawk and I absolutely know inspires all of us that knowing that coming from Collinsville, you can in fact accomplish great things. As has been said so many times, go Cayhawks. Thank you very much. We'll see you next year.